message for the ladies and gentlemen around the world and all the ships at sea. We all make choices, but in the end, our choices make us. So choose wisely. Subscribe to It's Eric Nagel wherever shows are found, on whatever platform you choose. And as always, leave us a positive review. Would you kindly? Another opportunity to practice my DJ ramp-ups. All right, two princes. Here we go. 95.5 WPET, you got Peter the Riff Griff shocking you and rocking you while I'm sitting here talking to you. It's 75 and sunny, which means our street squad's going to be out looking for them super stickers. If you don't got one, get down to Linoleum Depot this Saturday from 9 to 2. I'll be there hooking you up. Slap one on your car, win 100 bucks. Now I'm looking around and I'm seeing the spin doctors with not one, but two princes. Nailed it. It's Eric Nagel. Starts now. Ladies and gentlemen of the universe, the next voice you hear is Eric Nagel. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of It's Eric Nagel. That is myself. We are Sans Giddles today because he is out on Long Island doing something top secret. I, it's not top secret. He didn't tell me what he was doing, but he was gone for a few days, so he couldn't do the show this week. So I'm bringing in a stunt giddles, and I'll get to that in just a second. 651 Smithers is the phone number. 651-764-8437 if you want to get in touch with us here on the program. Social media for the program is It's Eric Nagel, and that's everything across the board. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Do all of those things if you would do us a kindness. On today's program... We've got some TV and news updates for you, but we'll get to that a little bit later. For now, we're going to talk to an old friend of mine who used to work with me over at the Opie and Anthony show over at Sirius XM. He was there for a handful of years. I think the last four years, three years, four years, something like that. He was there when the Opie and Anthony show ended, and he left shortly after that to go and open up his own production studio. And he's recorded all kinds of musicians and and uh, music projects. And he he went and did it himself. Very successful young man, my friend, Sal Galasio. Sal, hi, E Rock. How are you doing? It has been a long time since we have uh, not talked per se. We we've right. texted. We've had some rather late night phone calls, which were not as uh, as exotic. And uh, heated as people would like to think. It's usually, <laughs> I, was, over, I was turned on the entire time. It was usually. I'm looking through the Sweetwater catalog here, and <laughs> and talk me off this cliff right now. Yes, uh, S- Sal used to work with us at Opie and Anthony. He was an intern at first, and then was moved up to a, an associate producer. But yeah. he was, he was doing a lot of different things. He had production skills, so he was doing some of that. Uh, he was doing. Well, he did a production piece for the show, which after the first one, they were like, don't ever do a production piece for the show again. That's classic. I love that one. That one is probably, it's weird that that's your legacy, is don't make the panda angry. I'm completely fine with that, actually. I mean, I, th- I you, you think about any of the other production bits, I can't remember a single one of them, but if you want to talk about getting the panda angry, I think we all remember it. Well, let me play it here for everybody to remember. <laughs> oh, shit. You had it ready, of course. <laughs> Don't get the panda angry! You motherfucker. Well, I'm glad you had that on the ready. Yes. So <laughs> so, what, uh, so explain, <laughs> before we get into everything else, explain the panda. What, what was that supposed to be about? Uh, yeah, it was it was Roland, right? Wasn't that like a nickname for Roland? The it, panda or something? So it, and, yeah, it, it had to do with... Roland is very easygoing and very soft and gentle almost until you <laughs> prod it to to a point where then he turns into a monster and you don't want to make him angry. Right. I, I remember, you know, Roland is like literally everybody's friend. And then you could literally just see that look in his eye when the whole dynamic immediately changes and Roland would just. Yeah. He yeah. would he would freak out. Yeah. <laughs> Where it went from oh soft gentle giant to oh there's some mental illness that's going to attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Roland Roland is a you know he's a he's a tall dude so he can be very intimidating and uh, you know 
yeah, I wouldn't want, I definitely wouldn't want to get the Panda angry. And so I was trying to, you know, create a public service announcement and, uh, and I just, I just fucking did it stupidly. And then I just ran it into the room like a fucking noob. You were eager. You yeah. Were, you were yeah, eager. Like, sure. I just made this. Hopefully they're going to like it. And you ran it in. You didn't test it by anybody to make yeah. sure. Like, does this sound okay? I don't know if this is what I'm going for. So you ran it in and we played it. Now, two things. One, all the hosts thought it was terrible. But two. I mean. Yeah, and everyone thinks it's terrible. They were questioning why there was the wildcat noise at the end of it <laughs> when it's supposed to be about a panda, yet you're hearing like a cheetah or a leopard or something. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I, I, I still don't understand how you don't understand it perfectly. It makes perfect sense to me, but I'll stand by it. I'll still stand by it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think what, what other things were you known for? I think that was your shining moment. Yeah, that was my shining moment. I mean, I, I, a lot of people, oh. I mean, I, as you know, being in charge of the interns for a while there, every intern wanted to get on the air. I was right. not that person at all. Like I would be completely content never getting on the air. Like if they drag me in, of course you got to go in and you got to roll with it. But like, for sure, I, I was not someone who wanted to be getting on the air or stirring the pot too much. I just want to keep my head down and just do my work. Right. Um, like anybody else on the staff, we've had conflicts and clashes and public fights. Um, what, me and you? No, I mean just like us in general, meaning the show. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, for but sure. But you, you had a few as well. You you were no, uh, you were not um, protected from that environment is where you wouldn't have a clash on the air with some people. Do you yeah. remember anybody that you may have had a fight with on air? Um, on air? I mean, I mean, I remember when I first started, I, I really I had like one of the worst uh, interns beside me. Like when when I first started interning, he was just, you know, the typical like derelict, douchey, you know, I know everything about life sort of kid. And were you um, there? Yeah. Were you in the class with the kid from Occupy Wall Street? Yeah, no, that was that was, that uh, was I can't remember his name, but his yeah, name I, was, he was he was him. And he would literally just be like, you know, sleeping at the desk. His when name was Matt. Mm, okay, yeah, Matt. Not, I don't remember his last name, and it's probably better off that we do. But his name was <laughs> Matt, and yeah, we he he was he seemed personable at first, and mm. then it was completely the other direction. I actually, I think if I remember correctly, he was recommended or somebody. I don't know if we just saw it on his resume or somebody recommended because he worked up in Rochester at the cl cluster that Brother Wee's worked at. Ah, uh, okay. And okay. I, that's how we got the in. And then we mm. found out that he had a past that was not very favorable to uh, the work <laughs> environment. And yeah. we didn't find that out till later on. But yeah, then, he was but, just, you know, super, super hungry for airtime and just... Uh, yes and no. Like, he wanted the attention. Yeah. But he didn't want to do the work for the attention. Oh, well, yeah, of course. It's, it's Occupy Wall Street, dude. You know? Then he went down. Yeah, this was around the time Occupy Wall Street was starting to happen and, and come to the forefront of, of the news cycle. Mm. So he thought, and the only reason he got away with it is because Opie agreed with him and thought this was a good idea, that he would go down and be live from Occupy Wall Street or take a <laughs> recording and go talk to people. But... There were times where, like, where's where's Matt? Well, he's he slept down there. He was he was living down there for a couple of days. Yeah, I mean, shit. And he didn't come in because he would call into the show, and he figured that's all I had to do. And then it didn't show up for work. Right, and then just continue in the drum circle, and you know, yeah, the nonsense, you know, the nonsense. Right. Um, what else about him? So there was that, and then yeah, we were finding out about the uh, some uh, alleged accusations of his past. Which was I don't, we had to confront him on. What'd you say? What was that? I don't even remember that. Um, I'll, I'll due to legality, I'll tell you. <laughs> You'll te text me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, okay. <laughs> you know I'll text it to you right now as we talk. <laughs> but there, yeah. So there were some in incidents. Uh, there was an incident in his uh, previous employer that we were not fully aware of. He was Big also yikes. being lazy. He was like he was almost like a, a stoner hippie. Yeah, but, but like, he wasn't oh, full hippie. Like he was but like an there. upstate dude. Like it was kind of he was just like, you know, a hockey bro. But he I don't know. It made no sense. I, I I, don't think I ever really remember fighting with him, but I would definitely be tight at him when, you know, if if whoever gave us some work or whatever. And then he would just I, I remember distinctly like I think I was at Troy's desk. Troy was like, you guys work on this or whatever. And he was literally just out cold. And then Troy just came over just fucking staring daggers at him. Just like, yeah, 
yeah, like ready to literally murder him. Yeah, but, no, um, he, he was not very well liked. He was not a, no. um, a people person, if you will. Right. There, right, were also, yeah, there was sure. also an incident that we found out that we were giving some kind of prizes away at the time. <laughs> And you may want to check your phone while I'm telling you. Yeah, I just, I, I don't remember that. I can't believe I forgot, I would forget something like that. But holy shit, that's, yeah, we, that's insane. Yeah, Fuck we, that guy. Though. Yeah, <laughs> we found that out of, uh, a little bit too late into the internship. Um, what a piece of shit. Yes. So we also found out, too, that we were starting to hear from some people. We were given prizes away at the time on the air. Um, I don't remember exactly what the prizes were, if they were some kind of cash thing, or if there was some kind of DVD set, Blu-ray, video game, whatever. We were given away something. And we had a couple people contact us saying, and they were female, saying that he had contacted them. <laughs> so we we're trying to figure out i think i was dealing with the, uh, with travis with this we were trying to figure out like how did he is he contacting these people <laughs> <laughs> what a slime bag so we found we we figured it out travis had the winning for the the forms that you have to fill out the legal forms for somebody who wins a prize they were sitting in a pile of stuff on his desk so while we were doing the show matt was going through them Oh my god! Desk. And that that's sounds how, like a huge legality problem. Yeah, and one of the girls wound up working at some point at Sirius XM, and uh, oh yeah, god. she she was one of the people that told us, and it was true because there was no Jesus we Christ. had no contact with that person. We like we other than that person calling in, we didn't have their personal info, but he did. So I, I, yeah, geez. that was the last straw when we uh, he was down at Occupy Wall Street and he called in wants to be on the air and I had to tell him over the phone that he was fired. Don't even bother coming up here. <laughs> yeah. It's like right. we we took out your IDs. Don't even try cutting back in here. Yeah. We yeah, we had I mean, to can we had to shut everything down. And then he got all pissed at me, was blaming me for shit. Yeah, of and, course. Of course. Uh, then I think later on I heard from somebody that he was down in Tampa. I don't know how really? he got down there, but he was trying to get into the radio cluster one of the radio clusters down in Tampa. And I know people who work down there who had told right. me about this. I said, absolutely not. Did not <laughs> hire him at all. And I had to fill him in on Rochester. I had to fill him in on what happened up here. Oh, boy. And uh, the guy was like, holy shit, not at all. <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah. then he, that guy was, he threatened to, uh, he, I think he was threatening to sue at one point. Because uh, he, he hated me. He hated the fact that I was blocking him on some of these jobs because he was a piece of shit. And... Then something happened at SiriusXM where um, there was a lawsuit going on before they, lo they temporarily lost the internship program. This was after I, your time. Wow. The company was had a lawsuit. Uh, there was an intern that was suing for um, for something. I forgot what, what her her claim I, was. I I want to say I think she was a Howard intern. I, yeah, I think I actually got reached out by the lawyers while I was there okay. um, so that, about a class action lawsuit. Yes. Yeah. All right. So this adds to it. So, yeah, the lawyer of this person, uh, uh, this intern, was filing a lawsuit uh, against SiriusXM. That lawyer somehow got information of other interns during this time period and was reaching out to anybody else who ever interned in this time frame. Yeah, I, I got one for sure. I remember so, it. All right. So uh, before I get into the rest of it, what, what did they say to you then? I, I don't remember the specifics. I got to admit, I've I've repressed a lot of that <laughs> that, that era of my life. But right. um, I, I do remember it's something saying like very specific. It was uh, Howard related. I I don't think they would go into too much details unless you decided to to join in on it. Right. But but you know, I mean, it's it's fucking interning. I I even have interns now, and you know, sometimes you get to bark at them. It's just it's just the way it is. You know. So that was happening. Now this was mm. also in the time of. Vanity Fair got sued and dissolved their internship program. And that mm. kind of set the whole domino effect where Sony did it. Uh, several other corporations were getting rid of their internship programming, uh, in internship program, because internships were supposed to be for school credit. So you right. would get hired for an internship if you qualified through your college to get the internship. And then working that semester you would get credit used towards your school. And that was your payment, pretty much. You were right. to work for free, work for experience. And if it went well there, possibly a job. Yeah. But somewhere around this time, when was Occupy Wall? 2012, I think, right? 
somewhere uh, in there? I, I would say 11 or 12. 11, yeah. 12, right in there. This was, for some reason, this was around the time when now everybody's like, well, I, want, I don't want to do the internship for free. I want to be paid. Well, that's a job. If there was a job <laughs> opening, we would hire, you know, you could interview for a job. We have internships that are to assist other departments and learn these things. It's an educational right. program. It's not a job. Well, it is. These lawsuits started happening and these people were winning. So, right. Or, or it was being settled. Maybe them. they weren't winning. They were being settled. Right. So, But companies said, you know what? Screw it. Internship program's done. So now these these greedy kids, I'll say kids, greedy kids <laughs> um, were like, I want to I be paid. I want all this stuff. I don't want to do anything for free. I don't want to have to do all this stuff. Well, now you get out of college. A lot of programs don't have internships anymore. Right, because it's true. yeah, because they're yeah. like, I'm not dealing with the legalities of this, and now you just screwed not only yourself but generations after you here that are, are years after you there to get an opportunity to try to get into some of these industries that they want to be in. Absolutely, you're you're 100 right. By the way, I looked it up. It was uh it's like September 2011. I think that that shit went on for for a while. Yeah. Actually. Okay. So and yeah, yeah I mean, it, I I completely understand. When I was at Sirius, I I was getting college credit at the time. And I remember even like for my, I did like a second semester of interning there. I even like had to just like, you know, pay extra out of pocket, just be like to take like another, you know, four credits or whatever to fulfill the responsibility. For that the second semester. Just, right. That yeah. serious wanted to have like, you know, it associated with college credit. And then, you know, cause I, I, you know, I wanted to be there and a lot of people just want to get there to, for whatever reason, but they like, want to hang really out because they like either the, sh uh, what, not just our show, but whatever show they're working for. Mm -hmm. Or a company you're working for, if it's in the entertainment industry, they want to go, they want to be a part of it because they listen to somebody's show or they watch somebody's TV show. They want to be there. They want to meet celebrities. They want to get all these perks. Yep. They want to be in the environment. And I get that. But that's what an internship is for, is to work and learn everything at the bottom level so that you can move up and you can get a foot in the door. Because more times than not, it, if you only put 10% of the effort in, especially now, considering how it, people view internships and don't really do anything because they all just want instant gratification or, or everything handed to them. If right. you just put 10% of the effort in there, maybe somebody's got promoted and, and that job's available, or maybe somebody quit and left, or for some yeah. reason that job was opening. You're now being considered because they want to hire within. Well, you know what? That intern knows not only this job, but two other jobs and they're very good at what they do. Let's give them a, let's give them a shot. Uh, yeah, you have that one up immediately, and and more so than anything, I think you know if you're trying to intern at a place, and because I, I not only did I intern at Sirius, I interned at numerous recording studios prior to even interning at Sirius XM, so I knew the dynamic of keep your mouth shut, just do the work, and do it right, don't fuck up. Right. But uh, but additionally, you know, you also you also get a feel for the company. Every company is different. You know, you you know you have Sirius, a large company like that. I worked at what would be considered small businesses, and. You know, you have to figure out your place and where you sort of fit and what you can actually add. Because at the end of the day, the company is running just fine with or without you. And you need to take that into consideration. Right. And if you don't actually give them any sort of equity, something, some reason to hire you or, you know, anything like that, they, they, they don't need you. They'll just get another round of, you know, morons coming out of college who think they know their shit. You know, you have to humble yourself. You have to respect the fact that it's a privilege to be interning and, um, a lot of people don't. A lot of people want to, you know, get involved in lawsuits before they even got hired. Right. Know? So back to the lawsuit. So this girl filed a lawsuit. The lawyer was going around and spoke to you, um, a, yeah. a, a plethora of other people to try to get past interns on this lawsuit to try to bring some kind of class action suit against mm -hmm. Sirius XM. One of the people they reached out to was that kid, Matt. Oh, I'm sure he had all the time in the world to get involved. Oh, in yes, that. because <laughs> when that lawsuit was coming around, and it, by the way, it, that lawsuit turned out to be nothing. Right. Um, <laughs> but it, it did set a precedent at the company uh, yeah, that sure. they eliminated the internship programming. Uh, the inter I keep saying programming. The internship program as it was now not only do you have to have course credit you got you had to eliminate the amount of people you had interning at each department so right. we were down to two interns we used to have up to six now we're, we were down to two sometimes it was one depending on who was applying for what it was and they had to be paid they had to work a certain amount of hours and they had to leave the facility when you were an intern 
You stayed as long as you, if you were good, you stayed as long as you could to do anything possible just to be noticed, to see that, uh, that so people could see that you're there to pick up any kind of knowledge or skill that might be useful and, and make yourself more valuable to that workplace because that's where you want to get a job. We couldn't hire like that anymore. We were stuck with two, some departments had one intern, some departments lost their internships altogether. Right. Because right. they weren't deemed big enough to have an intern. And that was that's what happened with that dumb lawsuit that all the interns that we had got whittled down. It was very restricted. They had to have time cards. And yeah, the second yeah, the show that. was done, they had to leave. So they couldn't hang around and do any post work. Right, right. Like there is an enormous amount of work that goes on behind the scenes. I, I know I'm sure you've, speak, you've spoken about it a bunch of times, but a lot of people think that, you know, they just turn on the mics and then that's it. But there actually is an enormous amount of shit, especially, you know, when I was there, by the way, I got producer, by the way. Oh, good for you. I, you call me AP, but I got producer credit there. Um, uh, yeah, especially because we, we were doing the channel. It wasn't just the show. Yeah, I mean, it was the whole channel. The whole channel. I mean, I remember I remember me and you going in over like Christmas breaks when literally no, not a soul was there going in because the system wouldn't be able to program out like far enough in advance. You know, well, they didn't. Tr here was what was weird. So shortly after that, they gave me the login to the server so I could do it from wherever I needed to be. Oh, nice. But up until that point, they didn't trust any of us <laughs> to, <laughs> we'd have to, like, you're right. We have to go in during the holiday breaks. Sometimes I was getting a, a thing from, uh, we had the engine, the main engineering center for Sirius XM is called BNOC, B N O C. Yeah, you, you, you could call it engineering, I guess. Right. <laughs> and it, they were just overseeing everything that was going on. It was literally five guys staring at one computer screen. Right. Yeah. And sometimes you'd have to call them to make the changes and you're sitting there on the phone while they're dealing with all this other stuff and you've got to explain where the folder is, what the thing is called, or I'd have to go into the city and fix right. this stuff. And it got to the point where it's just like, you need to give me, I can't run a channel and not have the login to right. operate the channel. So Crazy. finally they had to give me that. So I could, if somebody, there was a problem, whatever, I could log in through this terminal that I had here um, at my at my area. And then I could just, at any hour of the day, I can go in and fix something before it became a problem. I mean, what do they think you would do? Like you would go in and upload a file that was... You know, no, it's just because it was Opie and Anthony. They didn't trust us to, to do a whole yeah. lot. They, that's why we always had babysitter management. You yeah, know, we had, that's at true. one point we had three managers that were yep. reporting. <laughs> one was reporting to one who was reporting to another, and we're like, <laughs> we don't need all of you. There's no need for these people, but they just yeah. didn't trust us. It's true. I, I did. I, I know people. You know, can say whatever they want to think, but once once Tim actually came in, I actually really did see a. A turnaround, like I believe he is someone who actually genuinely cared about uh, yes, for, radio for a as bit. A whole. For a bit, yeah, he he was. And, then, and same thing with Don when Don took over. I mean, it was like, oh shit, like okay, good. Now we have people who like thoroughly care about the product that they're overseeing. And um, I don't know, that, th those are like two very optimistic things. Don Wicklin is the man. He's the fucking. Well, man. here's the thing. So he would get shit on a lot on the air, and, <laughs> and I had to work a lot behind the scenes with Don and, and there there's, there's personality clashes with Don. We've all had it, but Don was not a person that I, I couldn't work with. You know, no. I could work with Don, even though there'd be times like Don, you gotta leave me alone or Don, I'm taking <laughs> care of it or Don, you got to handle that. You know, whatever it was, we could work together. Him and I, we'd always, we'd clash heads be just cause it's personalities, but out of all the other management we have, I could work with Don easier than I could with everyone else. Yeah, because some of the other management were like, uh, "I want all this done." Okay, <laughs> cool. I would not do it, and then I would tell them two days later, "All done, all set." Oh, that's great. Thanks. They never looked. They never, never looked. looked. Yeah. Don would take a look, and he's like, "Can I see it?" Yeah, and you know, you couldn't pull that over with Don, but I don't know. Which is good. I mean, ultimately, he cares about the he job. Does. The he does. He does. He just didn't. He job. Don wasn't meant to be a manager. That was the thing. Don was good <laughs> at what he was, but he was not meant to manage people. Is he still there? Do you know? He's still there. He works down in the DC facility. Right. He's oh, not, he has nice. nothing to do with what uh, faction talk anymore. I don't and, even know uh, what the fuck that is. But that's okay. the yeah. channel it became after uh, they realized the uh, Opie Radio thing was not going anywhere, so oh, they changed okay. it to faction talk. And it, well, it, I'm, yeah, I mean, it, like, like I said, like Don, like you know, if, if you if you needed something, I felt like I, he was very approachable, and that you could ask him for things, and it would actually it would actually get done.
Yeah. An- anyway. Enough sucking Don's dick, though. But I mean, yeah, <laughs> there's was, a lot of. Oh, I wasn't at all. There's other people. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I mean, our, our, I remember our, our office was fucking hysterical. It was me, you, and Roland. In and, one office, right. Yeah, we just had, like, I, I genuinely have fond memories of just being in there, like, really. A really fun work environment. One, rolling, one of the fun things sleeping half the day. One of the fun things about that office was my desk was away from your your two desks were connected. Mine <laughs> right. was you away can... from yours, and you would come in every day with the equivalent of what like a house a house cleaning person has, <laughs> where you're scrubbing down your your console, your yep. keyboards, your monitor, and you're shoving all the garbage back over to Roland's <laughs> desk, keeping it at the line. Uh, from your desk there, but not even bothering to clean it up. Like even if it was garbage, you didn't even throw out his garbage. You put it over on his stuff. Yeah, it's not my shit. Yeah, and he would just put stuff on top of it. Yeah, and not and throw it then... out, or he'd throw it <laughs> under his desk. Yeah, to the point where he'd have all this stuff under his desk that you couldn't sit at a desk with your legs under there. He sat with his. Um, you can hear me my inflection from the microphone as I do it. <laughs> people, um, he like your desk is here. He would have to sit with his knees at the desk level because right. there was so much stuff under his de- uh, under his desk that he couldn't use it properly. And then once in a while, Don would hold him hostage and say, <laughs> yeah, like you bring a huge, right huge garbage can over. And it's like, you need to clean this now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's hard to describe to someone who does like, who doesn't work, I guess in like Roland's position, but like Roland gets a, a, an enormous amount of mail every single day. Yes. And it would be promo shit. It would be, you know, screeners, whatever the hell it was. And it would literally just pile up tons of posters that are signed, um, DVD, you know, just tons and tons of shit piled up. And I remember you'd have, you know, an A-list. I'd be at my desk and you'd have an A-list celebrity literally fucking sitting in our office, just looking at Roland's just enormous amount of shit that he had lying around. Yeah. And shaking their head. Because we had that. We had the couch in the office, too, which was sort of our makeshift green room. So when the comics would come in, I remember one time Jim Jeffries came in and he was, you know, hungover and he (laughs) he was getting Roland got him breakfast and he was sitting down. He was going to eat the breakfast. and He looked over at Roland's area and he just like, yeah, I can't eat here. (laughs) He he (laughs) got up and walked and sat at somebody else's desk. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it was it was a fun it was definitely a fun room. Like, I I think um, next to our office was uh, Travis and Sam and their office was super clean, super quiet. And then, but their office you know, was also shared with, uh, Oh, it wasn't shared with Ron and Fez at the, at the time. Not when Ron I was Fez, there. Ron and Fez still I mean, had their, their office upstairs, but eventually it got, yeah. it, they broke it down half and half. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. But yeah, yeah I mean, and then sick. whenever sick. anyone wanted to stir the pot or you could hear Roland screaming from literally, you know, down the hallway, everybody would just congregate to our office and we'd be, Leave it alone. Uh, screwing around literally for for hours on end. Um, but it was fun. I, it's part of it's part of it. It's part of the whole you know environment. I remember one other incident or one other event that you were a part of. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I fought with everybody. I mean, we it was that environment. Like everyone talks about how toxic it was, but everyone got in it into it with somebody at some point. Oh but yeah. yeah, go ahead. All <laughs> and all those fights are all online. Uh, I get I still get messages from people. This is years <laughs> after it, where there would be, oh, you had a fight with somebody. I just heard it for the first time, or I'm listening <laughs> to it now, or that tequila and donut thing, which won't go away. I that's honestly one of if if any day I could remember it was my my favorite. It was it was definitely that one. That Thank day you. was fucking awesome. Well, for you, it was when you got waxed in studio. <laughs> oh yeah, but I mean I oh and then I threw <laughs> I. Th- <laughs> I took uh, one of the the post wax sheets and I slapped it on tra- Travis's head. <laughs> yes, uh, I, gotta, yeah. I have then, I have photos of that somewhere. I'll have to dig them up and put them online. Please, I'm sure. Yeah, show my my nuts online. I really no, really I mean the, the, the thing you throwing on Travis's head. Yeah, and then and then typical, you know, Travis went into the oh, you know, I I vouch for you. I got you know, I got you hired. Everybody played that game. Like yeah. whoever whoever like wanted to get into whatever, everybody always played the game of oh, I got you hired. And 
in retrospect, I believe only one person gets himself hired and it's you and you need to cut your own lane out within the company. But everybody's like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I got you hired. It's, yeah, you know, everybody that, everybody was a tough guy and, and you know, exactly being exactly a, being a, Every- being tough on the air and being being hard on the air. But the second you got them and yeah. if it wasn't an on air joke, but if you got them in real life, everyone yeah. turned into a baby. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and don't get me wrong, I will admit I got a lot of help um from a lot of people and I I took I took feedback very seriously just to, you know, help secure my position with getting a job there, but at, at you know, I I've been able to process a lot of that that time and looking back on it like I was professional, I did my shit, you know, I showed up on time, like that's, you know, one of the big things too. And I got myself hired. I don't give a fuck what anybody else says. I I got myself hired and that's that. So you were with us for how long? I um, I can't. I honestly, I couldn't tell you the exact amount of time, but I think it was probably about in total, maybe three or four years. Um, I I do know when. I know when I pretty much made the official decision to leave. Um, I so a little, a little extra story about me is like I I'm a musician through and through. I went to college. I went to purchase college for in the conservatory of music to do music production and those sort of skills help carry over to, you know, the radio realm. Right. And so I was always recording and producing on the side, even during my time at Sirius XM, I would literally get, what, what time did we get in in the morning? I don't even remember. It was like, we'd be uh, in the office. At Travis five. was usually the first one in there. Travis was there like four, four ten in the morning. Right. So what time we get there? Five, four, Everyone, five, yeah. Five, we were all there by you know, five thirty, the latest. Right, right. So five thirty, I you know I'd work till about two p.m. Uh, I'd go home to Brooklyn, sleep for a couple hours, and I was renting a studio with my per- college professor in in the city. And I would go back into Manhattan. I would have my side gig, record, produce, you know, all sorts of artists and stuff like that till about like twelve or one. Go back to Brooklyn, sleep for a couple hours, and then go back into Sirius. And I did this literally, you know, for a long time. So I always had my side hustle. Like that's, that's exhausting. Was, that just hearing you tell it. Yeah, I know, but I I love I love doing what I do. Like I love being in the studio with musicians and and producing and stuff like that. So I always had that going, and um, I remember I think it was over like I want to say it was like Fourth of July break or something like that. That um, I think it was I don't even know who, but I remember like getting a really bad email like on the corporate email um, mentioning the whole thing that Ant got uh, fired and everything. And I just I, as soon as that. I got that email. I was like, okay, it's, it's time to go. (laughs) Um, you know, half the brand is, is getting, you know, murked and we gotta, you know, I gotta get up and and leave. So, um, it was probably, I'd say a couple of months after Ant got fired from the company. However, so the fall of 2014, right. Yeah. I think I left in like September. Yeah. September of that, that year. And, um, I had a, uh, so I was renting that studio, but there was another guy who had another studio nearby, and he was talking about how he's going to, you know, rebrand, build up uh, his company and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I got a job offer with him and uh, and then I took it. And and then, yeah, so that's when I decided to leave. So you leave now. You got this new job. Uh, right. You have a partner, per se. Were you a partner or was he just like the owner and you worked for him? Um, well, I'll tell you a couple of funny stories. So I don't want to talk too much specifics about who did what. But um, okay. <laughs> I um, I was working for a company. And I also still had the other studio. So I was working, you know, once I left uh, Sirius XM, I was working for uh, that company pretty much full time. I had a a contract with him and or the company, I should say. And um, I was also doing still doing the recording stuff on the side. So I was pretty much doing the same thing, except I didn't really have to leave the studio as much. I would just pull, you know, 14, 16 hour shifts, just grinding it out. And then um, the company again i'm not saying anyone in particular but the company started not honoring my um my contract i had with them so i <laughs> i was starting to get tight and i was noticing a lot of things kind of looking a little weird from staff that was there and stuff like that so um i got into a fight with my direct uh not a fight i just got had a, had a strong conversation with my direct supervisor and um the, the dude was like, let's, let's reconvene in a week. Let's just take a week off from working. We'll, we'll get back to square one within a week. And, um, I, I said, you know what? All right. I'll, that sounds perfect. So I actually started looking for spaces to rent that I could probably possibly build my own studio. And within that week time, um, 
sure as all shit that Sunday night, the dude texted me. He's like, Hey, we good for tomorrow. I was like, nah, I opened up my own studio. Go fuck yourself. Um, I'm never coming back. <laughs> and wow. And yeah. And now it's been, um, June 1st of this month was me at this location for four years. So it's yeah. Four years later and still, still doing great. Well, that's great, man. <laughs> I mean, you, you left for, uh, another opportunity and it wound up spinning off immediately to uh, a bigger opportunity, which is what a lot of people want to do is start their own thing and work for themselves pretty much. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of perils in that for sure. Um, we're being your own boss. Um, but you know, I, I love the fact that I can make my own schedule. I can work as much or as little as I need to. I can rent the studio out to people. I don't even have to be here and I'm making money. You know, I, I love, I love that. I absolutely love that. But uh, a little side story. Again, I'm not saying anyone in particular, but let's just say someone at that company I was working with. We have a mutual friend who I um, I still work with. And I was like, you know, man, this this one guy, he's always so strange, man. Like he would be non-responsive. He would be, uh, you know, he would be acting all weird. He would ghost on me, like give me something to do and just not respond to me for a week. Some days I would go into work and just nothing would happen. I would get no assignment, no nothing. And he was like, yeah, the, <laughs> the dude was on meth. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and I don't, you know, I know you broadcast to everybody, but in New York City, meth is not common. It's, I mean, it's common, but um, <laughs> meth the, is more common. It's in, common the rapper? <laughs> I'm sorry? Nothing. It was a really bad joke. Oh, uh, the I shit s- cut out. I couldn't. I, I couldn't said hear. common um, the rapper, and I just repeated uh, the same bad joke. Okay. Awesome. Yes. Um, but, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's a- <laughs> exact response you should have had. Yeah. yeah. Um, so New York City so, yeah, is not a meth out, area. It's a heroin and an opioid area. Right. Correct. So it's very uncommon for someone to be doing um, meth in, in, New York, in New York City in general. So, I mean, it explains everything. I remember, you know, looking into this person's eyes and just like the vivid, like, you know, sh- like look of shock and like looking stoned at the same time. And it just explains everything. The, the erratic um, communication, the, you know, the way of using a computer, it just like so many things It all explained everything. And I, I laughed for probably about, um, I don't even know, 10, 15 minutes. The one, the first time I heard about it. And it really, it really summated everything that happened to me uh, working for that company at that time. Again, I'm not saying anyone in particular, I'm saying the company, the company. Right. So. <laughs> so you open up a studio, you find the location. Yeah. Um, yeah. I roughed it out for a little while. I had, I had pretty much all the gear I needed, but I had, I did need to, you know, pony up a couple of bucks to, to get a couple of necessities. And, um, and yeah, I've been, I've been rocking ever since. I have a lot of label gigs that I work on. Um, I've worked with some really awesome artists over the years. I'm really fortunate. So what kind and, of, well, um, what kind of studio? I mean, are you doing just like, is it like a vocal thing? Do you have a full setup for instruments, like a band or an orchestra? What are you doing? So, so th- this style of studio that I have, by the way, if you want to check out the studio, you can, I'm going to plug right now, uh, Instagram brass X beard. And, uh, if you want to check out my website, it's freshwaterstudiosny.com. Perfect. Um, I this, just dumped out. Uh, yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, <laughs> this, this style of studio is called an overdub studio where, um, you pretty much you're constantly you're, you're not doing like as many live recordings where like everybody's in the room together doing one take. Um, it's kind of more run and gun like, oh, do the vocal take, do the guitar, you know, do whatever. Um, I can't I'm a drummer and I can't record drums here. The room is just a little too small. But to someday fit hopefully the drum can, set uh, or just the acoustics would be horrible. Uh, both. OK, both. Yeah, I have a I have a thing called a whisper booth. It's actually a, a modular booth. And it's um, is that what you do? Re- I'm sorry. Is that where you do your AMSR? Yeah, I do. You know, it's so funny. I was, I was, uh, I was away this past weekend and this girl hit me up and she's like, yeah, I want to do an ASMR video. And I was like, let's fucking do it. Like, so I, I, uh, I actually have an ASMR gig coming up like, probably it, uh, early next month. Have you done it before or is this the no. first time? <laughs> no, it's going to be the first time. Have you ever but, checked? I mean, have you checked out what it is? Oh yeah, of course. Is I, know, it not, I know all those weird fetishes. Isn't it bizarre? <laughs> It's it's in my opinion ASMR is completely linked to uh, a sexual fetish. It's like that tickle in the ear that that people get off and helps them relax and shit. I mean, it's you know whatever. If it works for you, it works for you. I got to ask you this because you're an audio guy like me. Yes, audio drives me crazy if it's not done the right way or or if there's certain things that happen that just fucking freak me out. Right. So ASMR drives me nuts. Mm. It, and it, it's weird because when they start doing that stuff. It's I, there's all different forms of it. I mean, there's just there's. I think the more popular form is just a girl talking really soft and, and low <laughs> right. and sensual, right? But then you see other forms of it show up on YouTube all the time, where 
it's uh, they're feeding dogs food, you know, <laughs> or, <laughs> or uh, you know, there's kids playing with toys and there's just a, there happens to be a really expensive microphone sitting on the floor while a kid's playing, you know, yeah. and they're like, I don't get the, the, the whole I don't get the whole world of it. I know it exists. I just don't get it. But when you hear the people. Especially, the, the, like I said, the female ones seem to be the more popular videos. When mm-hmm. they're talking like this and they're crumpling paper, <laughs> all these little things. What that feels to me is like the equivalent if you had something that was just gently gr- uh, brushing against your fingertips, like to tingle a little bit, and it feels like torture. And I don't yeah, understand. It, it just it audibly it, it drives me insane, and I don't understand why people love this so much. Because it it's not like this has not been a thing for a while. It only got mainstream exposure or attention in the last handful of years. Right, right. I, I it, to me, it's like you know, like someone like rubbing a feather on the back of your neck and like giving you that chill. It's very intimate. Um, it's probably has some maternal, but, th- but that, but that can, psychology shit. Rubbing something on your neck like that. Depending who you are, couldn't be t- can be taken as a sensual kind of experience, oh, it, right? ASMR is a thousand percent sexual. I don't care what anybody says. People are like, oh, it helps me go to sleep, and it's like whatever. It's relaxing. No, you it, it's not sexually. relaxing to me because I don't feel any kind of sexual anything to it. I've tried. I listen to it. I'm like, this is. It just irritates me. It the, feels the like something. So like somebody's taking something sharp and kind of grace. If you are, let's use the neck. They're taking something sharp that's kind of running off the back of your neck. Like you feel that <laughs> slight paper cut of pain. Like yeah. it's going to heal, but it might start bleeding. You know, it, it's that kind of <laughs> torture. It doesn't do the, anything for me. I you, just you know, don't understand really why too. I don't get it. The um the the one the ones that really crack me up are the ones where like a girl's eating like a now and later, and she's just like <laughs> making like all these like disgusting awful mouth sounds. People would yell at, who knew we were, ONA were ahead of the curve? They would yell at us for eating on the air all the time. Now people are making hundreds of millions of dollars off of YouTube by purposely doing this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I I spend, I I can't even tell you countless hours editing, you know, mouth clicks out of vocal takes and um, these people on YouTube literally can't get enough of it. Or, you know, it's like a girl eating, you know, just eating, making all the clinky clank sounds and all that sort of bullshit. But yeah, I, I, I get it. Like, I don't, I don't judge, but it's, it's definitely, it's definitely not for me. I can, I can tell you that. Somebody sent me a package of stuff for my bit, the consumer where we try out snack foods and stuff. You're still doing the consumer. Still doing it, yes. People Fire. still awesome. <laughs> people still send me stuff, and we do the review. And most of the time, I don't like anything that anybody sends me. But <laughs> it's not true. There have been a few things. Somebody, uh, a listener of ours, his name is Blue Healer, at least online, sent me Skyline Chili. Do you know what that okay. is? No, I'm going to look it up though. What Skyline is Chili is this supposedly. Famous chili from Cincinnati, Ohio. Because when you think hey. chili, you think Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But Skyline Chili is is very famous from there. Now, from what I understand, it's just chili with cinnamon in it. I don't know okay. why, but that's a thing. So he sent huh. me a can uh, from their, their official product line of Skyline Chili. Now, I wanted to try it because I've never had it before. But... It has now become an audio aid on this program. Why is that? Because I'm using it for my own AMSR. <laughs> so <laughs> ASMR. Whatever it is. <laughs> ASMR. So every time that comes up, I go like this. I take the can and I said, well, I'm going to do it right now for, hold on, <clears throat> getting the voice. Well, everybody, I'm going to do this for you right now. I have a can of Skyline Chili. Here we go. Like that. It sounds disgusting. Oh my God. Yeah. It's, it sounds absolutely delicious. Crack yes. one open and put it over some Laguini that I'm looking at online. Oh my God. Yep. This middle of America shit is just hysterical sometimes. It's just uh like literally I'm looking at like pasta with four inches of yellow cheese. And- yeah, they serve it over <laughs> spaghetti. Oh God. It looks horrendous. It is horrendous. So you got your first <laughs> session coming up. That's going to be interesting. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the girl's really cute too. So I think she knows exactly what she's doing. Um, and uh, yeah, it should be interesting. It should be easy as shit too, because like all the little noises and stuff like that is highly welcomed in that community. As opposed to if I'm doing a song, I mean, that's major faux pas. If someone just has a major, 
mouth click. Well, mid, there's mid there's a girl now who is actually pretty well known and pretty, I guess, pretty famous with her music. That her, she said her music is in the style of ASMR. What the how? She played at Coachella this year. Sound um, like Billy Billy English or one of Bi- like one Billy of them. Eilish, I think her name is. Uh, yeah, maybe E-I-L-I- Eilish or English. E I Eilish. E I L I S H. Yeah, Billy yeah, Eilish. Yeah, yeah. If you yeah, listen yeah. to her, are you familiar with her music? Yeah, she does like this like faux fucking artsy bullshit. It's it's horrible. I don't like it. But yeah, I I, I get how people collect because she's like very whispery on a lot of vocal takes and stuff like that. Yeah, she she talks like this and. That. <laughs> right. It's like she's like, oh, you're so tortured and emo and deep. I think she's like 16 or 17, so it's you know. Yeah, but people. That, I, I only found out about her when I was watching the Coachella stuff, and I was yeah, she's a lot massive. Of, I she's saw making... a lot of, of these girls waiting for her to come on, and I said, I don't know who the fuck this is. And yeah, I'm she kind of like blew it. up overnight for sure. Yeah, it, it seems like she came out of nowhere, and I was listening to it. And I said, you know what? Let me. It, it, maybe it's this song. So anytime I hear a new artist and people love it and I don't, I'll go and dig for other stuff to see. I'm like, maybe this song I don't like. Because there's right, always right. music by artists that are huge. And you go, oh, that sounds terrible. But I like stuff off their album or other stuff that they did. And yeah, I went sure. and listened to some of her other stuff. And it all sounds the same. You yeah, know, she sounds like, like she's got daddy. It's like artsy shit. Yeah, yeah, I have I daddy like issues. I want to be sexually dominated by an older <laughs> man. Um... <laughs> You know, all this weird shit. Out of that. Yeah, that's the whole thing. <laughs> I just don't get it. But she's making way more money than we'll ever see. So yeah, no, I mean, she's more I, power I, to her. Props to her. Like I, I don't have to like it, but props to her that she's so young, making boatloads of cash. I'm looking at some like ASMR videos on YouTube, and it's just, it, it's insane. There's nine million views. Right. You know, a lot of makeup crap. But I, like, I it, but like anything for internet and Instagram success. You have to be an attractive female or an adorable animal or child. I, I always say that. If I was a girl, I'd be a fucking billionaire and I'd right. be the biggest whore on the internet. Um, try, you know, you look just at, try a like, regular guy. Doesn't matter yeah. if he's white, black, whatever. <laughs> a regular guy or regular a Joe, guy. I'll yeah. just say guy. A guy goes on there and starts talking like this. Like, hi, lady. <laughs> like You'll get he maybe has 1,400 looks, uh, 1,400 likes, and then an equal amount of downvotes on his video. <laughs> and the comment section is just trashing him, calling him, you know, the F word yeah, or whatever. Fuck this guy. Yeah. 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 But if you're no, a hot I mean, female, I, you can do the most inane nonsense and it's, make yeah. tons of money off of it. But it, like anything, it does have a shelf life. I, I think so. I, I think it helps people go to sleep, too. That's another thing. I don't get but, that. Like, You're an audio guy. If you heard AS, a, a, ASMR, what, that's right. Yes, yeah, ASMR. There you go. If you heard that, mm-hmm. it's not like a white noise that you nah, can makes use me to cringe. go to sleep. Definitely right. makes me cringe. You yeah. would be, the problem, like, the reason why people have TVs on going to sleep, they have music going on to go to sleep, or if they have the white noise machine that makes calming sounds or rain or whatever, it's because it's not distracting it doesn't require your attention and your brain it's, shifts it to linear, the background yeah. yeah yeah when you're when you got a, the uh, ASMR going the sounds change and you have to focus and your your brain starting like wait trying to understand what is going on here i don't know how you go to sleep to that I, there's one there's one where this girl I, I was watching this the other day just to you know get some reference just to make sure i i knew what this girl wants but um it's like this girl eating like a, a jar of pickles <laughs> <laughs> I gotta send this to you. I know you'd love it because you're you're See, a pickle boy. That's more my speed. This is more your speed because you're just more happy that she's eating a pickle more than anything. But yeah, this thing has 27 million views, and the channel is called ASMR The Chew, and it's just this girl. She's got her mic out. It's run by the Food Network. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Secretly run by the Food Network, and she's just going in on these uh, pickles and just lip smacking and everything. It, it, it's awful. It's it's really awful. But um, everybody today, I but yeah, man right here. <laughs> today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to enjoy some planters, heart healthy mix nuts. <laughs> oh my God, I'm halfway there. You're Am I doing going. it right? <laughs> yeah, you're doing it real good. Now I gotta crumple some paper. Yep. Touch the mic a little bit. There you go. Million dollars on YouTube. Yeah, there I'm you go. Rub my right scruff there. on it. <laughs> yeah. 
But yeah, I mean, it's it's just another niche thing of the internet. There, you know, especially YouTube. YouTube goes into these like deep cesspools and super meta things. Right. Um. But yeah, it it, it might fade out. It might keep going. Who the fuck knows? But if the girl's paying me, um, and she wants to book out a, a day's worth of work, no problem. Can I'll sit here imagine, and ASMR all day. Can you imagine that this becomes a uh, a big thing in your area, right? And yeah. you're now known <laughs> as the guy who produces. <laughs> ASMR. Now, you're producing artists. Yeah. You're making good music and quality products, uh, programming oh, yeah. that you're putting out. But now you're the ASMR guy. <laughs> I, and you're I'll start, embrace it a thousand you're percent. You're getting way more business and way more money from these weirdos coming in than you are yep. from legitimate musicians and uh, up and coming hip hop artists and dance guys <laughs> trying to make some you know legitimate stuff. And he's like, you know, I had to stop going to that studio. Why, man? She's got some naked chick chunkling paper. She's got a candle going. I think she's eating pop rocks. Like it's I a whole will, thing over there. I will a thousand percent embrace the ASMR community. If you guys want to come here and record some, you know, if you want to eat ramen for four hours, let me know. I, a, I'll, I'll order. You had some kind of jug band. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I don't know what the fuck's going on at that studio. A, gr- a growler band. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. just playing the growler all day. But yeah, I mean, it, it is funny, but you know, it's, it's just a niche like anything else. I, I'm, like I said before, I'm convinced it has some sexual roots. Um, it's oh, it, it, you know, it does. Sexual. Yeah. I just say that it doesn't, I don't have that connection with it. No, I don't either. I mean, you know, one of my friends, he's really into feet. I, I've never had a sexual attraction to feet. I ever, have an but. anti-foot fetish. Yeah, me too. I tell a girl to put on her socks before we fuck. You know what I mean? Yep. I can't, I can't. I, there's guys I know that have shoe fetishes that have foot fetishes and they're like, no, look how pretty your feet are. It doesn't do it for me. It's actually kind of uh, like repulsive. Yeah. I, it, it, and that makes no sense to me. And, and there's numerous times where my friend would be like, do you see your feet? And I'm like, I didn't even look past nope. her knees. You know what I mean? Like I, I didn't even think once to look at her. Someone feet. told me once, cause we were having this conversation. Somebody told me once, I said, the fact that you have such hatred and disgust for this means that you're a foot fetish person. I said, how is that possible? That makes said, no sense. He yeah. said, because you think about it so much that you know you hate it and you know the specifics. So you really, you do like it. I go, no, that's bullshit. I know what I don't like. You can, <laughs> you, lo- don't like you can know details about something you don't like. That's why you don't like things. You're supposed to, yeah. When you say you don't like something and they go, why? You don't like this song. Why? Oh, I don't know. I just don't like it. That's not an answer. <laughs> When you can right. rattle off details and go, all right, you got a minute here. Let me tell you all these facts that I that I know that as to why I don't like this thing that you know, credit that makes it credible as to why you don't like something. You know, it's so funny you bring that up. I often um, tell this to people because, you know, I, people are often asking, like, how do you, you know, articulate certain things like I'm playing part psychologist sometimes, you know, someone trying to work out their feelings and stuff like that when right. I'm when I'm recording them. And I will often say, like, if someone says, oh, I don't like something and then their answer is. I, I don't like it just because I think you actually have a just right because. to sort of just, yeah, yes. Um, you have actually have the right to sort of contest that opinion. You know, you should respect everybody's opinion, but you have the right to contest it. Someone usually should have some sort of validity to their opinion. I don't like it because X, Y, and Z. And then it's like, all right, well, at least now we can understand why and work with that information. But if someone's just like, I don't like it. And then it's like, well, why don't you like it? I, I just don't like it just because. And then it's like, well, I can't fucking do anything for you now because you're just being a dick, um, a dick and non-observant. You know what I mean? You need to be a little more sensitive to the <laughs> the world around you. But, right. but getting back to the, um, the foot fetish thing, I, I don't know this is as fact but someone once told me that there is a um there, there's like a nerve that goes to your feet and then that goes to your brain and then from like your groin area that goes to your brain and there are these two nerves apparently run right next to each other and there's a lot of crosstalk like they're them. on the same transit line yeah they're yeah. on the same train they're that just doesn't different stops yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but um, you know where i learned that from remember oh being in new york city you would see these you know those asian places that you walk past and they have the video screens oh yeah in the in the window for yeah, acupuncture and reflexology rub and, rub and, and they should if you're sitting there and like if you if it's near a lunch place or if it's raining and you're under the awning or whatever you've seen those asian places that have the TVs running in the in the front window there and you see oh, yeah. they show the feet and they show this travels to your brain like that's the only way i knew that that thing existed i didn't learn that in school 
I'm yeah. not a medical student. I didn't watch anything on it other than you see those TV show, uh, those TVs in the windows all the time in New York City. I'm like, oh, apparently stuff from your feet travels to your brain. Makes sense. Right. I guess. The, by the way, every one of those places, there's there's so many in my neighborhood. Um, they're all rub and tug places and they all get busted. They get shut down. They reopen. It's really I thought their, their sole purpose. when I was living in Brooklyn, I thought. Those ones were the ones that no, those are the legitimate because they were like old people or something. Like yeah, that, but then I'm sure they got like you know some girl in the back who'll come out if you you know. You I never thought those were the, the rug and the tuck Korean, places. The I always just thought those. If you saw the television, like if you saw the Chinese cat with the arms moving and everything, okay, <laughs> then yeah, that's that's on the on the down low. But the ones that had the television and all the medical charts up, I thought those were just the strict. Okay, why the, then? Why are they open at you know two a.m. on a Saturday night? You know what I mean? Like, like why? Well, like that, see that I don't know because I'm a, I'm at the, home already in bed. <laughs> all the light is blocked out. It's all you know, like the, the screens in the window or whatever. But why the fuck are they? Who's getting a massage at two a.m. on a Saturday night? That is right? true. Think think about that. Think about their uh, their business hours. Well, I learned something today, Sal. Thank you. Oh, of course, you rock. I thought they were just you know, I never bought into acupuncture to begin with. Yeah. So I thought it was just one of those places like I don't I'll just go to like a, a real place for if like my neck is killing me or some or massage or I'll go to a chiropractor or something. I right. thought those were just like alternative medicine <laughs> kind of places. Well, I guess they were all I, I, I hate to say it, but I guess they're all rub and tug. Even the Chinese food places all rub and tug. Yeah, <laughs> you can definitely get some general sows and a fucking, you know, hand job in the back for sure. You just have to ask. You have to order the right way. You know right. what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so dumb. Back to your studio, I guess. So yeah. let's talk about some of the artists and, and the people that you uh, you help and, and you produce here. So you said you have a setup where, except for the drums, but you can have guitar sessions, bass sessions. Do you have piano sure. available there or um, keyboard? Yeah, or? I mean, I, I, I use, um, I'm going to use a MIDI controller when I got to use piano. It, it's just a, it's essentially a piano, but it's an on off switch. And we use software to essentially recreate that sound. Um, very few studios even have you know, real pianos anymore, even uprights. They're stupid, expensive to maintain, and they usually sound like shit. So, right. Um, I have a Casio really SK1. Shit. Are you serious? Yeah. Do you remember you those? S- yeah, the one that you could speak into and it samples. Yep. Yeah. Do you want to get rid of it? If you want to, I have the original that. from I, when did it come out? Like the late eighties or something. I yep. still have mine. Yeah. I, I'll buy it from you if you, if you don't want. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm still holding on to that. It's, okay. Yeah, no, they actually fetch a pretty good uh, penny online. They um, a lot of people do this thing called circuit bending, where they essentially just open up like an old school piece of electronics, and then they just create shorts. Why they you know they make uh, additional connections from within, and they make it just glitch out, and make all sorts of crazy sounds. And the SK one was um, a very common one. Um, the speak and spell. Do you remember the speak and spell? Yes. That's a very common one too. Um, anything of that that Casio era, uh, late eighties, early nineties, um, makes some yeah, cool they, stuff. Yeah, that, it's a very common thing. It's called circuit bending, and um, really, really nerdy and lame. And then they like install switches in them to like recreate that glitchiness stuff. But um, but yeah, SK one is a really, really awesome instrument. Really, really cool. I will have to <laughs> dig it out. I have it in one of the the bins in in the vault room. Uh, well, make sure you take the batteries out because anytime you open up something for that's been our, oh know, i never in, store anything with batteries yeah yeah because that shit just leaks and gets I'm, everywhere i'm not a noob here you know <laughs> i learned that lesson as a kid when if the batteries were in there too long and you go to open up and it's all this crystallized acid Ugh, and God, you're sitting there trying to you. scrape it out it's like i can't <laughs> touch this but i'm gonna scrape it all out and hopefully with some rubbing alcohol or, or nail polish remover i can clean the <laughs> the uh the the springs at the end for where the batteries connect and hopefully right. it'll work again most times it does a lot of times it doesn't but most yeah, times you, it does you're probably just ingesting you know battery acid for most of the time when you end up well, you do it acid. outside you know i learned by the <laughs> second time you do it outside <laughs> um but, but but yeah so i have the uh i have a setup here where i do a lot of in the box stuff, meaning um, a lot of software manipulation for almost all sounds. I do have a lot of really cool analog gear, you know, reminiscent of older recording studios. But um, I got, you know, some nice speakers that'll rip your head off if I turn them up loud enough. Uh, I got a lot, a lot of nice microphones. And um, and yeah, I do everything from production, sound design, um, mixing for TV, film, commercials, um, any sort of audio need. I, I kind of have it covered. Do you get a lot, because you're in Williamsburg, yes. so in Brooklyn, I'm sure you get a lot of legit musicians, you get a lot mm-hmm. of uh, hip-hop artists yep. looking to uh, to either take their stuff to the next level or try to develop 
their stuff from the ground floor, like they're new to doing everything. But do you yep. get those weird bands since you're in such a hipster area too? Like the people that try to do, we're kind of like Radiohead, but we're, we take it to <laughs> another shitty. level. Yeah. You know where they're uh, playing. <laughs> what's the uh, what's the thing from Doctor Who where you wave your hand through the sound waves? Oh, a theremin. Yeah, a theremin. Think. You know, by the way, Doctor Steve is a, quite the expert at a theremin. I, you know, I actually still keep in quite often communication with Doctor Steve. He Me is too. one of the the nicest guys um, that you'll ever meet. And uh, yeah, he's he's got a nice actually setup. He's got a lot of nice cool synths and um, he's into Moogs. Uh, it's Moog, you fucking Moogs. noob. Yeah, it's pronounced Bob Moog. It's uh, um, I call it Moogs. Moog. Yeah, two I mean O's. it's it's the same shit. It's, yeah. it's literally the same <laughs> shit. <laughs> um, but yeah, we we do keep, keep in communication every once in a while, and um, you know he'll ask me a couple of random questions here and there to help out with his audio stuff. But Doctor Steve's the man. I fucking love him, and um, I don't know. Next time I pass through the South, hopefully I'll go visit him. But do you get those guys that come in with those weird electronic? kind of sorry uh yeah you did, yeah i didn't answer that um yeah i mean i the problem is with those those sort of genres in general they try to do very diy stuff um and there's what that means is they have no budget you know what i mean i i'm very strict about the way i run my business side of things i get paid in full for everything i have clients literally all over the world and i don't even open up their files until they've I, they've paid me um do you a get lot of those, assholes trying you know, to barter um, I do get people trying to barter. I don't, the only time I really hook up anything is if someone's trying to book like a large amount of hour hours, you know, of recording or production. Um, but if it's small stuff, I'm just, yeah, I don't, I don't budge. I don't, I don't really have to budge. I, I have, I have people who are willing to wait two, three weeks to work with me. So like, why do I need to, you know, even offer a discount? Um, but yeah, a lot of that, a lot of that more DIY hipster rock stuff. Um, they'll usually just record the stuff like in their rehearsal room or, you know, very, very minimal, um, production value there was a guy i knew out on long island he was in a ska band and oh boy. He, no he was in a ska band for a while and then one year his mother passed away from cancer and he, it hit him really hard that mm. his brain kind of either broke or went in a completely different direction so he went and uh, he went to school. Where did he go to school? I think he went to Purchase, SUNY Purchase. Yeah, that's that's where I went. And he became like quite the big deal up at Purchase by really? doing this weird. I wish I knew what the fuck kind of music. It's like like experimental electronica. You're talking about Dan Deacon? Yeah, you know Dan. I, I don't know him. I don't know him personally, but I know that Dan Deacon went to purchase. I know yeah. that. So Dan, yeah. Dan's the guy I know. He, he actually worked with uh, me on a radio show at WLIR in Long Island. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I know he is, you know, he's another one of those, like if you get a little bit of, you know, um, <laughs> fame or whatever, when you go to purchase, pretty much everyone who goes there knows that um, Regina Spector went to purchase. And I, I think she's awesome. She's a fantastic artist. I'm trying to think who else pretty much Regina Spector. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so Dan does this weird electronic stuff mm -hmm. where, uh, oh, what's the same guy? I, why am I forgetting yeah. names? The guy, Super who, hipster. The guy who, who's the band leader now for James Corden on The Late Late Show. Oh, um, uh, Reggie, Reggie Watts is it? Reggie what's Watts, okay. So similar to what Reggie Watts is doing where he would record his voice, make samples, and turn the samples into music while he was doing other stuff. But then he had weird electronic stuff, too, where he was doing sort of the circuit board stuff that you were talking about, different connections, patching different cables, making weird noises, and then just developed this into a whole career of this music style that, like, he's still traveling around the world playing shows. He, I yeah, mean, he's yeah. got a Dan's, great career. Dan's huge. Yeah, he's he's super famous. I, I don't particularly know his music, but I definitely know that Dan Deacon went to purchase and uh, he's super successful. He, you said he was into ska previously. He had a ska band called channel 59 on long Island for, for many years. Huh, interesting. And then after that, uh, that time with his mom, uh, he ran a couple of ska, uh, sorry, a ska cancer benefits. Called hmm. can uh, I think it was called cancer sucks. I think he did about hmm. three of them. And it was just a huge collection of ska and punk bands that would play at uh, like the theaters at high schools or, or um, other kind of music venues and raise money for for cancer research and, and what That's have awesome. you. That's awesome. But then I guess when he got to purchase is when he started going in this whole other weird direction and <laughs> became this other Dan Deacon that I wasn't very familiar with anymore. But right. he's been very successful, but 
Like he's he he fits that kind of genre of what might be you know showing up at your studio asking to get recorded in in Williamsburg. Yeah, a lot. Like again, a lot of those guys are very DIY. I bet Dan does most of his records, or did a majority of his records, like on his own, just just keeping it super DIY, not as um, you know formal in a studio setting. Um, but people, you know, often talk about Williamsburg and how hipster it is, and it's it's it is to some degree. Um, but if all you have to do is go to purchase for one weekend, and that is like Hipsterville on steroids. I, I used to call it like Hipster Training Camp because it, it was just the most ridiculous shit like on you know the the old joke of you know astronaut uh <laughs> helmet you know wearing you know sandals and shit like that like that's it is insane up there it really really is it's a fun school i love it i love my program like tons of props to everyone who i trained under up there they're phenomenal phenomenal musicians but the people up there are absolutely weirdos there was another band that i know that went to purchase I'm trying to think of their name Ah, uh, fuck. Bands from Purchase. Uh, uh, it was, they were called What's Your Problem, Brian. <laughs> no, that was the name that def- of it. That's definitely a ska band, right? Yeah, it was a ska <laughs> band from that area. I knew a lot of ska bands. Oh, you know who else went up there? Was it uh, guys from The Bravery? Maybe. Yeah. Wow, The Bravery. Wow, that they, they were a good band, actually. They were. They came fuck. out the same time when those... those um, I don't want to say boy bands, but those New, rock New things. New York Wave. Yeah, yeah like where, where The Killers came out and... yeah. Yeah! Wow, the bravery. Good, good, good callback, man. Yeah, I think one of them went up there, and one of the one of the men in the bravery was in a ska band Vegas called Scaba the Hut. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! These I I am not trying to talk shit, but I hate ska. I, I know you like ska. I know you like. It's just I how do you not s- like a, a rock band with a horn section? You can keep it. You fucking keep all. Of that. You're not a you're not a fan of the brass, are you? Are you I, more I of like- a woodwind? kind of guy <laughs> i'm more of a keep fucking horns and trombones out of like you know pseudo punk you know i i just I, I don't like it i'm not i'm not a fan of it but look if you like it that's oh sorry that's they didn't go to you. purchase they went uh up in poughkeepsie but they went to vassar oh po town nice. yeah. yeah yeah for sure they went to i yeah. knew it was up in that area but uh, yeah they went to vassar and uh, uh sorry this i got this confused again the mm. one of the guys they were in a band called scaba the hut <laughs> they weren't from Vegas. That was another guy I knew who had a, van- a band out of um, out of Vegas, and I think their name was called the Sorted Jelly Beans. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so the, the the guys from the Bravery had a ska band called Scaba the Hut. Scaba the, I mean, it, the the fucking ska bands. The names are absolutely hysterical sometimes because um, there there a lot of them are clever puns. They're always, yeah, they're always, I, I forget, I think I was playing like Overwatch recently and this guy just went on this like enormous run of knowing like every single like ska band and I was just c- crying laughing at the fucking names. Oh yeah, they're, um, they're a lot of fun. They're, it's, it's hysterical. Look, I get it. Like it's party atmosphere. I'm all for it. Let's go bowling. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I remember them. <laughs> you know, let's go bowling. Of course you do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I used to do a, a ska show, ska punk and indie rock show on L- WLIR with yeah. Jason Wolf, and uh, yeah, we had all those bands sending our uh, sending us their stuff to play on the radio. Because who, other than Less Than Jake and Real Big Fish, right? Mighty Mighty um, Boss Tones, Boss Tones, Cherry Pop and Daddies, Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. There was only maybe maybe enough bands that you could probably count on two hands that got radio play during that third wave stuff that came out. Right, but there wasn't all the major stations were not playing that, so I, our our station was. So we would get bands from all over the place, mostly a lot out of California too, like Asian Man Records and Kung Fu Records and all of that, sending us their stuff. I think one of my professors in college had a a lot of connections, or he produced like a Scatolites record, and I'm, I'm noticing that I know the Scatolites. Yep, yeah, but I'm, I mean, I'm looking at some of these names, man. I'm just fucking, I'm. I'm I love it. I, I love it because I don't like it. You know what I mean? Like, I remember where Let's Go Bowling. Vo- I think they were Voodoo a California Gold band, Skulls. Let's Go Bowling. Let's Go Bowling. Uh, th- I, I know Goldfinger. Uh, That's a California band. Goldfinger, Goldfinger, by the way, John Feldman, the lead singer of, of Goldfinger, wound up opening up his own studio and producing a lot more bands that were even bigger than what he did with Goldfinger. I mean that's that's the fucking dream, isn't yeah. it? I mean, yeah. That's I mean, he, awesome. he he developed a lot of um, obviously of you know Southern California, Orange County style bands, but he's produced a lot more bigger acts than. And the Goldfinger was not 
anything to uh, to mock well, either. Big. They had huge success. Huge, yeah. But he took that and went back into the studio. Plus, he's a diehard vegan. He's an advocate for shutting down, Ugh. you know, chicken and cattle farms and things like that 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 um, don't treat the animals ethically. Yeah, don't get me started on that. But let's keep talking about Sky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the on, on the last Goldfinger album that he, they put out, or one of the last ones, there's a bonus hidden thing on the D, on the CD. That yeah. you put it in, and it starts showing you a documentary about animal uh, farms and all that stuff that he helped produce. I don't think anyone wants to see animals get tortured, but at the end of the day, I, I enjoy eating meat. I mean, perhaps <laughs> if they have the ska riffs of the Goldfinger band playing with there, and then you're like, all right, I can. I came for the music, but... It's, it's not so bad. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm looking at all these names, and I'm just fucking crying like the movie so and the epitones do you remember them <laughs> oh, no no okay. the radioactive chicken heads i don't even do you know some these? some bands like some punk bands and some ska bands just had obscene names or just were being to- totally ridiculous so it would draw attention to them but they had no music to back it up i think it, it, i just saw sublime sublime would probably have the most commercial success i'd say uh, uh sublime yeah Sublime, because Sublime was a mix of punk and ska together. Right. Like their earlier stuff had some ska stuff in it. Oh no, even the last album with Bradley Knowles on it had some some horns in there. Oh yeah, they love the horns. But yeah, they they would be real big. Fish was big. Less than Jake was big. Fishbone was Fishbone. big. Fishbone was big in the eighties, going into the night. Like they've been around forever. Boss Tones were very commercially successful for a short run. They yeah, that was huge. every like teenage movie. Uh, yeah, they were in a lot of 2000s. movies. Yeah. yeah, Reverend Horton Heat. The rockabilly <laughs> yeah. stuff started coming in when you had uh, Social Distortion was yep. be uh, on their off season, so Mike Ness would go do his own rockabilly stuff. You mentioned one that was kind of rockabilly previously, a couple minutes ago. Um, Reverend Horton Heat. No, 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 no. Is that zoot suit bullshit? Sorry. Oh, Cherry Pop and Daddies. Cher- yeah, 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 yeah. That's them. That. Yep. They were sure. rockabilly. Eh, they were doing rockabilly. that. Oh, they were doing swing more than yeah. ska. Like they were infusing the two together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god, these these names are just too too much, man. I I, I, I look. I, I'm not going to judge anyone for liking. I, I like a lot of weird music that you know probably wouldn't be generally you know accepted. But at the end of the day, if you like ska, fuck it. But I just hate like the whole skanking dance and the fucking the hat, the pork pie hat, all that that shit. I'm trying to think. Fucking, trying to think who we pr- corn is fuck. Going back to all right. So I got the list here from for John Feldman. Here's who we produced. Some of these bands had like a one hit thing on radio. There was a, a a girl punk band called the Veronicas. I remember. I know K- the Veronicas. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, he produced Good Charlotte. He produced uh, Messed, The Used, Story of the Year. He he produced a thing for Ashley Simpson, mm-hmm. Hillary Duff, Goldfinger. Obviously, he did some stuff for Blink One Eighty Two, All Time Low. Panic mm. at the Disco. Yeah, he's he's All-Star making more Weekly. money off Plain that. Plain White Tees had a huge hit. Yep. Uh, Five Seconds of Summer, which is the I guess the second tier boy band after One Direction. They're I think the Five Second guys because I used to see them at Sirius all the time. I think they're from Australia, but they were uh-huh. huge too. Yeah, he he had that like that um, emo punk rock shit early two thousands late two thousands uh, on lock. I mean, he had everything. Look, he had. More than enough money and, and success with Goldfinger for what for yeah. what they did. I mean, they helped push Tony Hawk's video game into the stratosphere, that whole franchise, mm-hmm. because their Superman song was on that Tony Hawk game that became oh, yeah. really big because it was a punk ska soundtrack, and he helped orchestrate a lot of that for that game. And in the same aspect, that game, once it, you know, it w- became one of the biggest games of all time, launched a lot of the bands that were played in that game into their own popularity as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember playing that game as a kid, like, religiously. That was, like, my shit. Man, I mean, look, I'm looking at this guy's profile. He did also uh, Godsmack in 2018. What a... Sorry. Yeah. What a fucking snooze. Uh, but, but yeah. still big, big, big money, though. Disturbed, Blink-182. A lot uh, of those rock bands, like 311 and, and Disturbed and um, Godsmack, like you said, they're not getting the radio play anymore because there's really no rock radio left yeah, but they tour that like, like maniacs. That's though. the thing. They're constantly touring. So even when you're like, oh my God, Disturbed, it was funny. <laughs> it's like, I remember that. Well, what the fuck are those guys doing? And then you look at online, it's like, and they're playing to 80,000 people in Japan and in Germany yep. and all. And like, they never stopped. Yeah, they're it's huge like, uh, everywhere else like, but here. 
311 is playing like PNC like every other weekend during the summer somehow. You know what I mean? Crazy shit. So when but are yeah, you I producing mean, these kind of bands? When are you going to make that money? I fuck. Trust me, I wish I could. But I, at the end of the day, I, you know, I I, I genuinely enjoy working with uh, independent artists as well. I do a lot of label gigs, and there's so much fucking nitpicking drama that goes on once a label has. Um, put up money and they want to see a lot of return for their equity that they've invested in artists. So it, it you know, even to have like a, uh, my, my lawyer look at like a entertainment contract that I got to deal with for a, you know, a label is just a nightmare, man. It's like, it's crazy. Sometimes it's, I, I almost enjoy working with independent artists cause we have a lot more creative freedom and you know, it's a lot easier <laughs> for sure. So talk about some of the artists that you're currently producing now. Um, right now, I mean, I, I work with, you know, numerous, numerous people. I have worked with, um, uh, this dude, Joey Badass, uh, this group in his group pro era, uh, it's another dude, Mick Jenkins. These are all, you know, mid to upper echelon, uh, you know, hip hop artists. Um, right now, I mean, I'm just pushing, you know, my, my friend's record, one of my best friends I produced and mixed it. And, uh, I think I sent you that track. You did. Earlier. We're going to play that going to break in a little bit. Yeah, it's my boy uh, Bubs and uh, AR. He's featured on it as well. These are super, really, really super talented dudes. Um, they're also they are some of the most technically talented people I've ever worked with. But additionally, they're also like going to have some lines in there that are going to kind of make you laugh because they just they're so good at what they do. They have that <laughs> elevated level of creative confidence to get away with saying some wild shit at the same time. But um, but Bubs was on Sirius XM recently. He was on with Sway and. You know, they're you know you got to make little moves to eventually well, get that's, your ground. That's not a little move. That's a major move to be on with Sway. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. But it's you know it's you you got to make a lot of those moves to to start getting you know to a certain level um, that you want to be at where you're a lot more comfortable. Um, so, but yeah, his next record's coming out pretty soon. We just got it back from mastering literally uh, yesterday, and uh, yeah, tracks tracks pretty fire. <laughs> Uh, what else is there left for you to do here? I mean, you work with a bunch of different genres in your studio. Is this how you want to do the rest of your life, producing other people's stuff? Do you want to produce your own stuff? Um, I yeah, I've always seen myself as a producer. I I being a solo artist is there's so many perils in that, and kind of like what I was just talking about, where you have to make enormous amounts of small moves. Uh, I feel you know, I realized this very early on, even when I was in my my teens, that being a producer or an engineer, it allows you to work not only multiple genres, but with numerous artists. Um, once you, you know, once you've kind of pigeonholed yourself into like, oh, you're a ska band, you know what I mean? And then let's say that ska band tomorrow turns around and does like an uh, avant-garde, you know, jazz odyssey. Um, they're not going to necessarily retain the same audience. So it, it's it's very difficult. And and being on the other side of the glass, uh, I have a lot more artistic freedoms that I can, I can take. So I, I do enjoy working with, with numerous artists. Eventually I would like to just do produ production and mixing. I would love to never go to a tracking session again in my entire life, but you know, even in a couple of minutes, I got people showing up here to do a tracking session. So, um, it is what it is. That's, that's, that's the goal. Well, look at you. You've grown up. Yeah. So yes. Well, I, uh, yeah, I hope to be back again and we could talk about, you know, some video games and twin peaks, you know, some weird shit. What did you think? And you know, I'll talk to you about that before we go. What did you think sure. of the the third season of Twin Peaks? I thought it was amazing. I I, I just it's it, how do you even interpret it? There's it's just so layered and so deep and weird. And, was the White Lodge uh, not what you expected? The White Lodge was kind of always what I thought it was, but there's just so many like nuanced things that. Um, I also I've said this numerous times. I, I'm a musician through and through, but I do believe David Lynch is the greatest creative mind that the planet has ever seen. Someone who does you know film and and sound. Um, it's just so it's so nuanced. There's just so many creative ways to interpret everything, and that's another thing that I love about Lynch is he specifically says, "I will not explain to you." you know what this means or what it is. He says it means whatever it means to you. You know, it's just profoundly layered creatively and we can sit here and talk about it for hours and have numerous conclusions but he's he wants us to talk about it and and our take on it it, it things I, I don't like when things are creatively spelled out so literally for you and that's why i loved season three there's so many there's so many things even from season one or sorry season two is like oh i'll see you in 25 years and then shit the it <laughs> was 25 years <laughs> yeah like there's there's so many things that we, we could talk about it for 
for eons. I, yes, was, I, I was a little frustrated with the fact that they had, um, uh, what was Dale's name when he was changed into the other person? Um, Dougie? The one Dougie. That we were when he was yeah, Dougie. Dougie. I thought the Dougie thing went way too long. I, I remember when it was on and you were telling me, like, I can't do another episode of this. And I think, um, what did you want him to do? Did you want him to come back and be talking about donuts just like it was? No, in no. One, two, I, I kind of wanted him to event, like, try to think how many episodes there was. There was a lot. Yeah. There was shit. There was a lot of episodes. I kind of wanted him to come out about halfway through and then not realizing the time lapse and trying to piece things together and right. well, spend more time with the. Lo- I mean, we saw a lot from the White Lodge. But it wasn't mm-hmm. really connecting to the Black Lodge, per se. Right. And I wanted to explore more of that and less of him being, you know, having this kind of governor on his brain that he didn't realize who he was and what he was doing. Yeah, it's a, a, that's a very good way of putting it. Yeah, I, 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 I see both sides. I mean, if he went back to the same sort of cheesy character he was when he was much younger, I think that would be kind of... You know, sort of contrived as well. So I think I'm actually kind of glad that they went a little more ambiguous with it. Um, yeah, I didn't you know, want to see him. Too. I didn't want to see you know him on the tape recorder to Diane or say this right. is an amazing <laughs> right. cup of coffee. I didn't want that that version of him, but I wanted him to be coming out of here and then being so weathered and being yeah. pissed, like almost like an angry guy. Like what? he's now is like we need to fuck this place up or shut it down or figure out what it is that's going on here. Like yeah, there's I mean, just they, an they entity it that's huge... there. They don't really explain where it came from, why it's operating, and or that they were putting a stop to it or it was taking over. It's just it was still coexisting. And even the ending of the series, where if you haven't seen it, yeah. then I don't give a fuck. I'm not just saying spoiler. Yeah, At the end of the series, all they did was whatever the powers that be sent them in a time loop. Yeah, it was a, it was a, cliff, a massive cliff, cliffhanger yeah, there. They, yeah. ju- they jumped him back. And then he realized, like, what year is this? And then she started screaming. Right. And then it just ends. And you're like, well, that answered nothing. I don't. I was even trying to figure out, well, what would be the interpretation of it? And I said, I think he just is fucking with us. <laughs> like, That's there's the no either that or he had no ending. And he, he plays it off with that art stuff. Like, oh, it's whatever you want it to be. No, you had no <laughs> ending. And you just had her scream and it shot out the power. And that was it. I, I think that's the beauty of it, though. I, I love the fact that it's not spelled out for you, and I love that it's fucking crazy ambiguous. Uh, I love there's tons of random things that, that I, believe it or not, a lot of people on YouTube do a, a fantastic job of breaking it down. But again, you take it with a grain of salt because it's. I was all listening to that subjective. podcast. There was a, an official Twin Peaks podcast. I think right, EW right, right, right. was putting it out at the time. And they would break down each episode. And I was listening to it. And sometimes they were like, I don't even know what the hell this was. <laughs> and they, the were, they were doing research. Like it. they were checking out Native American folklore. They were checking out <laughs> stuff that were that was uh, history to the area where Twin Peaks is supposed to be. I love the fact that it's ambiguous. I love the fact that there's so many side things that make zero sense and you can interpret it a- any sort of ways. And the other thing that's really creepy, too, though, is that numerous people passed away. Once they were done filming that. Yeah, the log uh, lady. Lo- log lady. She Albert was suffering passed. from cancer. and Yeah, it's very creepy that a lot of people actually passed during the, the production of it. And they worked um, it into the show, too, where yes, she did die fucking, in, in the show. Yeah, it's deep. Like, I love that. It's very profound. It, it makes it makes the surreal sort of cross into the reality. And it's it's awesome. I fucking love it. I love David Lynch. Long live David Lynch. Did you see that they worked in um, when he his first visit to the Black Lodge? Mm-hmm. And uh, the thing that was growing, the the uh, the tree, the tree that was growing was from yeah. his other movie. Was, uh, I was, think it was yeah, from Eraserhead, from, right? Was I think it? like the, the the pieces of it were from Eraserhead, but yes, I, yeah. I think you're right. And I think the the um, the little person, whatever the, whatever his name is, he was. I think he's still alive, and like he made some comments way back. Wasn't in his the name day. Hand? Wasn't he the other? Uh, wasn't he the uh, the? Hand? Oh, he was Arm. Well, yeah, he, he was, was the, he was, uh, what's his face, his arm, the man yeah. with, yeah, exactly. He was the arm and he was like the person who kind of transitioned to that lodge, but he was still alive, but he also made some like not favorable comments about Lynch. And I think that's why he wasn't invited back for a season three. Oh yeah. And they, they just made him into a fucking twig. <laughs> I just I, I love it. Yeah. They, uh, he, he was shitting on Lynch when he was doing that carnival show on HBO. 
Right. And they right, were interviewing right, right. him and they were like, oh, we knew you from that. And, and yet he went into the whole thing, how he hated it and didn't make any fucking sense. And that Lynch was an asshole or something. I was like, oh, we're yeah. not going to see him again. <laughs> no, and then exactly. rightfully, and there it was. And that was, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, that was one of the best parts of the original Twin Peaks seasons. Was I love I loved the Black Lodge stuff. And he would sit there and talk backwards. And that, I mean, that was great. Yeah, I loved that. That time was just so eerie and... um yeah, I fucking love it. I, I love, I love it. I'm, you know, you got me thinking about. It. I'm gonna probably just rewatch all of it. I was thinking, right I was yeah. just thinking the same thing. Or I may just go on YouTube and watch the videos and let them explain it to me. <laughs> that, that I might too. do that. That was. I mean, I, were you there when he was at Sirius? I did meet. I did meet him. Yeah, towards okay. the end. Yeah. All right, because yeah. I remember uh, Travis was uh, or is a big David Lynch fan, yeah. and I heard he was just finishing up with something. He was out in the lobby, and I said, "We got to go get a photo." So we ran yeah, to go yeah. get, say hi to him yeah, and get I was, photos. I was there. Yeah, I lo- I love him. I absolutely love him. And the um, yeah, I, I I can't get enough of it. Absolutely can't get enough of it. Uh, one quick thing with David Lynch, he's not involved with the reboot uh, rebooting Dune. Oh, yeah, he's completely not involved with that at all, right? Yeah, he has nothing to do with it. But he did the original adapt- adaptation of the first book in 1984. Right. I, I can't get through that fucking film. I, that is horrendous. I, it's I know. I tried revisiting it recently, too. And I said, well, you know what? Maybe I was too... Because 84, I was six, five, mm. five or six. And watching it, even in my 10, year, you know, 10 to teen years, I was like, maybe I just don't get it because when I started to realize Twin Peaks and David Lynch, like a lot of his stuff is very artsy and very complex and layered. Yep. And I'm like, maybe I just wasn't in the mindset to understand it. So I watched it again, I think a year or so ago. And I'm like, Nope. As soon as I see those giant slug things at the right, I'm like, Nope, I don't get any of this. Oh, this Patrick Stewart. Look at that. All right. <laughs> oh, is that sting? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, Ooh, it's sting. Like, the continuity. Everything about it is, is bad. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, he was able to, there's a there's a name that directors use once they don't want to have their name on it, and I think he he put his yep. name as that fake name on the doing on doing that that version. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he did. He like had major a major fallout with the studio, if I'm not mistaken, and because like they they edited it into a whole like you know massacre, and he wanted to get his name completely off of it. Well, rightfully so, because that movie made no fucking sense. Absolutely horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. Well, the new one's coming out. He's not part of it. I don't know if David Lynch is doing anything anymore. I haven't heard anything. He does like painting, I think. He does. I mean, I as far he, as c- uh, cinematic releases cinematic, go. Yeah. Hopefully he does some something related to Twin Peaks. It'd be awesome if he did like even just like a special to wrap up. The way, and the way television's going now, the streaming services are throwing money at people just to come up with, you know, brand new, unique stuff to yeah. get people watching. Netflix or Hulu, I mean, uh, Amazon Prime or something's got to throw him some money. It's like, hey, look, you may not have another Twin Peaks uh, in you, but you could come up with some weird stuff on your own. Just yeah, do Twin Peaks from another perspective or something like that. Just some weirdo fucking crap. or I'll, season I'll four of Twin Peaks started yeah. from where she's screaming. They're in the time loop, and then continue from there because that's what I want to see. Yeah. For sure, they made they even made David Bowie into a tea kettle. You remember? You remember yes. That in the, in, the, they, in season three, I don't know if that was his voice left over from the movie, or if they just had an impersonator doing yeah. the thing. But yeah, he, they kept referencing him, and I was like, "Is he coming yeah. back? Did he?" And back. he he died shortly before this came out, so yep. I thought. Did he film something? Like, was this going to be the last David Bowie project? Is he going to show up in this thing? And then, yeah, he was a tea kettle. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I, I look. There's a lot of ominous things surrounding Twin Peaks as a whole. And um, the and- last time we saw him was in Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> yeah, bring back him. What was the, his fucking character? His character was ridiculous. Yeah, I he would just it. yell, hold on, let me take your out. <laughs> what? <laughs> Diane! <laughs> Diane was oh, great, too. Him. When they revealed her, I thought yes. that was amazing. I'm like, wow, she is she she was like a double agent. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, she um yeah, she became like a, a, a weird spirit thing, right? Wasn't that it? Like she turned into something. Yeah. She was part yeah. of one of the lodges. Oh, love it. Love it. Absolutely love it. All right. Uh, Sal, I know you got to go. Uh, let's sorry, plug yeah. Let's plug your social media so anyone can find you online. Sure. Yeah. I only have Instagram. I mean, I still have Twitter, but I don't, I don't use Twitter anymore. But yeah, Instagram, Brass X Beard. And if you want to check out my website or any other studio related stuff, you can check out Freshwater Studios, NY.com. Thank you so much for having me on, E-Rock. Hopefully I can come on again 
sometime soon and we'll chat more. No, that would be great. Now we're going to go to break here with this song. Tell everybody, uh, the artist, the song, what's this all about? Oh yeah. This is my boy, uh, Bub Styles at Bub Styles and a R A R X V music. Uh, these are my two, some of my two best friends. Um, this is Bub's project that's coming out. He was the dude who's on sway. He's got a lot of eyes on him and, uh, hopefully we'll be seeing him a lot more of him in the near future. What's this song called? Uh, DBTB. You'll see why. <laughs> All right. Here it is. Thank you very much, Sal. And uh, we'll return after the break. Thanks, e I said, fuck it. It's Eric Nagel. It's Eric Nagel. More next. It's Eric Nagel. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, and Facebook. At It's Eric Nagel. On your phone with the iHeartRadio app. And on hundreds of devices like Alexa, Google Home, Xbox, and Sonos. Hey, it's Colin Quinn. E-Rock made me come in and do a goddamn promo form right now. I'm being held hostage by Eric Nagel, who you're listening to right now, and it's Eric Nagel. Welcome back to It's Eric Nagel, segment two, as we are in the very beginning of summer here in the Northern Hemisphere. My name is Eric. Still sans giddles. Thank you to Sal, my old buddy coming on the show in the first segment there if you missed it how did you get to segment two go back and start the show over again and hear segment one and hear sal and all the fun stuff that we got to talk about i don't know who skips to segment two but look you downloaded you subscribed i appreciate that maybe you know friends that want to subscribe to the show and also skip to segment two tell two friends so they can tell two friends etc etc got it got it good Looking back at last week's box office, coming in at number one, Men in Black International. I think that's the fifth one in the series. Fourth one in the series? Either way, I'm not watching it. Number two, Secret Life of Pets 2, that I want to see. Aladdin, the live action from Disney, in at number three. The Elton John biopic, Rocket Man, in at number four. And at number five, X-Men's final entry in the Fox Marvel universe with Dark Phoenix. Not doing well not doing well at all financially it's doing okay but the reviews for it have been horrible i went and saw the movie a lot of frustration with it very little action and demeaned some of the characters they made them look weak for no other reason there was like there was no justification for for why these characters looked so horrible other than they just kind of puttered out and just like uh, look throw the credits on it we have to put this out we're contractually obligated to finish this movie I mean, it took for it took years, a bunch of rewrites, reshoots. There were problems all over the place with this movie, but it's out there if you do care to see it. Opening up this weekend, it's a big weekend for the summer box office. We got the reboot of Child's Play with Mark Hamill voicing that of Chucky is out this weekend. Also, Toy Story 4 is out. You know, that's probably going to be the number one movie of the next couple of weeks so you want to go out and see that. There's some other movies that really aren't uh, that big a deal that are also out. But you can go check them out if you want. On the 26th, the latest in the Conjuring universe, Annabella comes home. Annabelle, sorry, comes home. That is coming out. On the 28th is Yesterday. That movie where it's some musician and the world somehow forgot about the Beatles. So while he's playing Beatles music, nobody knows that it was already done by the Beatles. So he becomes a big to do, if you will, almost as big as say the Beatles. So you have that movie to look forward to July 2nd. When is July 4th? July 4th is on a Thursday. So you have a really extended weekend. You have a five, four day extended weekend for July 4th. Unless you get the third off, then you have a five day Extended weekend, a two-day work week, if you will. July 2nd, the uh, Spider-Man, Far From Home, the second Spider-Man, and the continuation post-Endgame in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That is available for your consuming pleasure. What else is open for July 4th weekend? No, that's nothing. What is this one here? No, that's nothing there. Nope, just Spider-Man. Ignore the other movies. They're not really that big a deal. Oh, it's only Spider-Man. That's what you want to go out and see. But if you want to go out and get some Devadez or Blu-ray, if you have one of those things that play physical media, like I do, 
We told you last week, Captain Marvel is out and available. If you haven't picked that up, you might want to do that. If you haven't seen it, if you got that time off for the July 4th weekend, that might be the time for you to go and check that out. But also for this weekend, Us, the Jordan Peele movie, is now available on DVD and Blu-ray. I have not seen that. I'm going to watch it. Um, I have been told that the plot, here's a spoiler for you. Spoiler coming in three, two, one. It's a Simpsons episode. It's a Treehouse of Horror episode for us. That is the plot of the movie. I won't tell you which one. I'll leave it to your imagination. But it's a Simpsons episode. If you've seen the episode and you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've seen the episode and you go to watch the movie, you will know what I'm talking about after you watch that movie. Anything else? There's some movie called Beach Bum, which I never heard of. But I've been seeing advertisements for it all around. Who's in it? Matthew McConaughey, Snoop Dogg, Zac Efron. Seems to that this would have been some kind of big box office deal, but apparently not. So that movie's available if you need to go and find something else to watch. And I think that's about it for anything notable as far as the physical media releases. What other movie news do I have here for you? Uh, Oh, so this came in at the last minute. So Kevin Fahey, one of the men responsible for the success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe under the Disney umbrella, has officially confirmed that they were trying to recruit Keanu Reeves to join the MCU in some way, shape, or form. Now, he's been busy and receiving a lot of success with the John Wick movies and a couple other projects he's working on. He's got Bill and Ted 3, which is starting production very, very soon. And that's going to be out for the summer of 2020. He has turned them down at the current moment. He said uh, he's got too much stuff going on and it's just he, he can't do make any kind of commitment. But according to Kevin Fahey, that Marvel is not giving up on pursuing Keanu Reeves. Hopefully that the actor will change his mind at some point when they can find the right role that'll make him fit into that MCU. I was thinking about this. Who would Keanu Reeves be in the Marvel Cinematic Universe that hasn't already been cast? So that means we got to think of characters that have not been introduced and not just the ones for the projects that have been announced, projects that still haven't been announced or if they will be announced so it's open to whoever's left in the marvel universe and there's a lot of characters that we have not seen or been introduced to and that could be anybody but who would he fit the best and one name came to mind mr sinister i think he would play a i think he'd be a better villain than he would be a hero in the mcu So if you know who Mr. Sinister is, I think he would be great. Now, there's a whole bunch of characters that haven't been introduced yet and won't be for years now because they're just not ready to do so. And that includes the X-Men universe, which is now going to be taking a break and sitting off on the side for, I think, the next three years before Disney is going to touch the property, as well as the Fantastic Four. Now, that doesn't mean that they won't show up sooner than later. As of right now, from what they said, they have the next phase planned out and ready to go. And they've also revealed slots for the next 10 years. Is it 10 years or six years of movies? Uh, Yeah, six, six, eight years. Somewhere in there, a medium of one to 10. Five years, (laughs) whatever, it doesn't matter. They revealed many years coming of release slots for Disney-based movies meaning Disney, meaning Pixar, meaning Star Wars, meaning Marvel. They have a whole bunch of slots reserved. None of them have been titled, except for the next year or two. Past that point, nothing has been revealed. But they have stated that now that they've acquired Fox and that merger is done, the Marvel properties that Fox was controlling are going to be rested. So Fantastic Four and X-Men are going to sit by the wayside while they work on things currently. But... Marvel has been known to pull surprises out of nowhere. And they could say this now. But then when that next thing is revealed, there could be a tie-in to Fantastic Four. There could be a tie-in to something to do with Wolverine 
or ga- maybe Gambit if they get their ass up and, and make the Gambit movie that everybody's been waiting for. That could happen. We'll just have to wait and see. But I would love to see Keanu Reeves in the MCU. I think he would be a better villain than he would be a superhero. My vote right now is Mr. Sinister. I think he would play that off really really well. I think somebody else told me once that they thought John Hamm would be a good Mr. Sinister. And I think John Hamm is just good in anything that he does. But I think John Hamm also is another guy that needs to be a villain, not be a superhero. I think it makes more sense to do it that way. But we will see. We've in the meantime, we have John Wick three out right now. If you haven't gone uh, and went and see it, you should go do so. And he has Bill and Ted three coming in. Well, two years from now, no, a year from now, twenty nineteen. What am I doing? Yes, twenty nineteen. A year from now, that's coming out, and we will all be excited, and we all will rejoice soundly. Let's move over to the streaming stuff. Uh, over in Netflix. We've talked about, you know, Black Mirror is out. We've talked about the fact that the good news that Lucifer is returning for season five, but it's going to be its final season. And unfortunately, this puts our hopes and dreams of some kind of Sandman crossover to sleep. See what I did there? Wordplay! Because uh, it doesn't look like Sandman's going to cross over into the Lucifer universe. I do hope, because it's a DC property, I would love to see them do something with Constantine, but that doesn't look like that's going to happen either. And we've also told you, I think last week, that the series that Giddles and I are very fond of called Love, Death, and Robots, it's 10 short stories that have to deal with love, death, and robots. Um, is on Netflix right now. They've now picked it up for a season two. So another 10 stories is going to be coming and I can't wait for that. They also renewed Russian Doll. If you haven't seen that show with, uh, what's her name? Natasha Leone from American Pie fame and Orange is the New Black. It's about her dying on her birthday and reliving the same day over and over and over. And each time she relives the day, she's... um, she she's dying if you will she died but she comes back she dies she comes back she starts to decompose as each day comes around it's an interesting weird story you should check that out also a new a new trailer is out the third trailer for stranger things season four which comes out on july 4th so if you're excited about that i join you in that excitement but the new trailer is out if you go and take a look at that it reveals a little bit more about what's going on with Stranger Things, and uh, that's July 4th. You can tie that in to, if you go to the movies, then you can tie this in with your DVD watching, your DVR watching, and binge watch the new Stranger Things season coming to Netflix. Also, middle of July, the new season of Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee. They just revealed the lineup of the comedians. They're going to be in the cars getting coffee with one Jerry Seinfeld. And the big news of it was Eddie Murphy is uh, joining the interviews for this season. And that's a big deal because Eddie doesn't do a lot of things like this. So we have that to look forward to. I'm trying to find the list here. I had it up and I accidentally closed out of it with the comedians being revealed for the, for the new season. Some of them were a little weird that they picked to be part of this thing. Cause I didn't think th- that they were big enough or important enough to warrant being on the show like this. But I guess some there it's up to Jerry's call. If he likes these people, then, you know, they're going to be on his show. He can do whatever he wants with it. It was just some odd pairings in this season, but there's some big names too, that I'm excited to see. As we said, Eddie Murphy, Seth Rogen's going to be on there this season. Ricky Gervais, who I love is going to be on there. Uh, Jamie Foxx, Sebastian Maniscalco, Martin Short, Mario Joyner, who was actually on in the first season because I think Mario was on with Colin Quinn. I think they did a two for one on that episode where they were at a coffee place in in um, the Red Hook part of Brooklyn. Mm. Ah, sorry, I was enjoying a beverage. I'm trying to think who else is on there. Bridget Everett, which is the, I, I think she's one of Amy Schumer's camp. If I remember right, the big blonde lady is part of Amy Schumer's camp. And but this one was was interesting. Melissa Villasenor, who you know from Saturday Night Live. And that's all I really know her from. 
I was looking around. I don't know, uh, see any of her other credits that make any sense. But she's on there. And then Matthew Broderick, who I guess can technically be listed as a comedic actor. But he's not a comedian. So I don't, you know, how, see how he fits into there. Again, this is all Jerry's personal preference. So I'm sure it'll be good. I'll watch it. I know you're going to watch it. Why wouldn't you watch it? Why are you saying you're not going to watch it? You're just saying you don't want to watch it now because I said I want to watch it and I want you to watch it. You're just being difficult. I see what you're doing here and I'm not going to put up with it. What is this here? Mark Hamill ready for re Jedi retirement following the rise of Skywalker. Oh, he wants to give it proper closure. Does he? I never understand that. Actors who are more than this one role. Yeah, you are. But if everyone accepts you for that and you're getting quite a nice living based off these characters or these movies, these franchises, if you will, it might be annoying creatively, but you got to learn to accept it because you'll, you know, you'll always be working. You'll always be involved in a project some shape or form because of this. But what can you do? Oh, I had something else I wanted to tell you about. I should get Chad Dukes on the phone because he's a big Jaws fan. We'll have to talk to him another time. Uh, Jaws. It's the end of this week was the 44th anniversary of Jaws. If I got that right. Is it 44? Yeah, I think it's 44th anniversary of Jaws. And there is news coming out. The original shark. Everybody knows this story. If you've seen any of the documentaries or film pieces about the making of Jaws, that shark was a huge pain in the ass for Steven Spielberg. There was all kinds of mechanical issues. They would get it to float and then it wouldn't operate or sometimes it would operate, but then it sank. Like there was a whole bunch of nonsense they had to deal with. A lot of reshoots, a lot of creative editing and patchwork on the actual mechanism. It wasn't a CGI shark, folks. This was the 70s, kids. They didn't have that kind of stuff. Everything had to be made by hand and run by people or maybe some kind of remote control. So that shark is being recreated and restored. Sorry, not recreated, restored. What it was left of that shark is being restored and it's going to be displayed at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. Now, the museum's not going to, uh, will not open before the 92nd Academy Awards, which is, I believe is, I don't know, it's always, it's always fluctuating. So it's either the end of January or the beginning of February next year. Let's see if I can see that real quick, if there's any kind of time. No. Okay. But the, uh, the announcement from the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures said, just in time for the 44th, it is 44th anniversary of Jaws, 1975, so you don't have to do the math. An update on Bruce. I forgot the shark was named Bruce. Wow, look at that. Yeah. An update on Bruce the Shark's restoration. They're showing a bunch of photos here on their official Instagram account. Special effects legend, uh, I, I can't read the name of the Instagram account there. Uh, his studio, KNB Effects, and the Academy Museum conservation team have fully transformed this undersea giant. Wow, those photos do look amazing. They've repolished it. They repainted it. They've restored everything. And it's going to be on display. This is awesome. If you've ever been to the Museum of Natural History in New York City, when you go to the aquarium area, they have a life-size replica of a blue whale, which is the largest mammal on this planet, hanging from the ceiling in the center of the aquarium. When you go in there and you look, it's the first thing you notice when you walk in there. It's dark and there's this big glowing blue whale hanging from the ceiling. If they could do something like that, where the shark is hanging from the ceiling somewhere in the museum, I think that would be pretty cool. Uh, let's see when this is going to open here. The museum says that this will be the fourth and final version of the shark made from fiberglass made from the original model. Okay. They also announced that the fans will not get to see the shark in person for quite some time as the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures will not open before the 92nd Academy Awards on February. All right. It is February, February 9th, 2020. But that's all right. So it's not open before the Oscars. Who cares? It's going to be open next year. 
It's not like they say, well, you got to wait another five years before this thing opens. It's it's less than a year. It'll be fine. I, I, it may warrant a trip out to Los Angeles to actually go and see this. That's really cool. I'm very happy to see that. I will definitely go out there for the Jaws and go pet the photo of the Jaws. Pet the photo. Take a photo of the Jaws and pet the Jaws is what I meant to say. What else do we have here? Um, there was something else in this year in history. This week in his oh Ghostbusters two, that's what I wanted to talk about. Ghostbusters two, it is the anniversary of the theatrical release of Ghostbusters the Deuce. Came out in 1989, and a lot of people didn't like the movie, but I think a lot of people did like the movie. People are just more vocal about saying they didn't like Ghostbusters two. I'm a fan of Ghostbusters 2. Yes, it's not like Ghostbusters 1, and yes, Ghostbusters 1 is amazing. But Ghostbusters 2 was its own thing, and I did enjoy it. Because what were they going to do? They couldn't go back to Zool and that stuff right away after they just destroyed Zool. You know, you got to give it a little time. And I think at that point, by going in this direction, they were expecting the third movie to happen while they were making the second movie. They were like, well, this is going to do well, and we'll, we got the third movie in, in, in the works. Because Dan Aykroyd has famously said that he was always uh, trying to push this third movie where the Ghostbusters supposedly die and they go to hell. So it'd be Ghostbusters in hell trying to get back to, to uh, reality, back to the world of the living. Which makes sense. I mean, it fits perfectly in there. And there's still time. They're, they're making another Ghostbusters right now, which is technically going to be Ghostbusters 3 because it's the continuation of this universe, not the Ghostbusters 2016 one that uh, that uh, the female Ghostbusters. It's not falling into that line. It's falling back into the original line. So anyway, Ghostbusters 2. I thought it was a great way to go. It was, it was a bit different. And it shows over the span of years that it showed what humanity is. You're famous at one moment, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, uh, you're has been the next. So the Ghostbusters two movie opens up with Ray and Egon performing at children's parties because that seems to be the only gigs they can get because there hasn't been any paranormal activity since they shut the door to the other world and defeated Zool and Gozer. Or yeah, Gozer it was Gozer the. Yeah, Gozer was the top one, not Zool. I had that mixed up. But anyway, they kicked their ass. And now there's been a lull in paranormal activity, so there really wasn't any use for them much in the city of New York. And then strange things are put. A painting is possessed in the art museum. There's a pink sludge oozing through the city. Who are you going to call? The Ghostbusters. And they're back. It was a lot of fun, especially when they got the Statue of Liberty moving and they're asking if she can go any faster. And Egon says, I don't think they make Nikes in her size, Ray. Ray's always fucking up, asking the dumb questions. But the people who have the uh, the quick witted retorts to Ray's lines. Brilliant. Anyway, so yeah, Ghostbusters 2. The anniversary of that came out this week, 1989. If you haven't seen the Ghostbusters movies in a while, I highly suggest you go back and watch both of them. I just redid, not redid, I just rewatched the Indiana Jones series about a week or so ago. And it's one of the better things you can do for yourself. It was so much fun. I think I'm going to go back and revisit Ghostbusters again very soon because I was excited to read that it was the anniversary of that. And then we're starting to see little things creep out very slow about the new Ghostbusters movie, but still, there's one on the horizon, so it's very exciting to to think about that the, this fine franchise is going to continue after the disaster that was the 2016 movie. Anyway, the reason why I brought up Ghostbusters, not just the anniversary, but also Ghostbusters 2 had some offshoot things from the movie. They had two music videos. One was by Run DMC. They did a video and a song called Ghostbusters. It was okay. Not their best work. The video had Sigourney Weaver and Annie Potts in it as their dates. And if you look quickly, you saw Dan Aykroyd, Ernie Hudson, and Bill Murray as concert security 
for Run DMC as they were performing the Ghostbusters song on stage. And of course, they move, uh, mix in movie clips, as you do with a music video. But the other video was Bobby Brown's On Our Own. And I rewatched this video and I was amazed at the amount of celebrity cameos that were in this video. And the first one that shows up around the minute two mark, Donald Trump. Donald walks out of Trump Tower all pissed off, looks up at his building and there's a projection of Bobby Brown's video up on Trump Tower. And he's just looking annoyed like what the hell is, is going on here? Current president of the United States was mixed in with all of this stuff back in the 80s. And some of the stuff you forget about. He was tied into movies. Like I said, Ghostbusters 2. He's in Home Alone 2. If you haven't seen Home Alone 2 or if you forgot about it, he's in there. He's uh, Macaulay Culkin's in one of Trump's hotels. He was tied into the WWF at the time. He hosted WrestleMania 4 and 5 at the Trump Marina in Atlantic City. And uh, yeah, he just shows up in the weirdest places because you forget about it. Now, because it's so polarizing as him as the president, you see him everywhere. You forget about all these other little corny things that he did back in the day. But it's just weird to see that. Uh, other celebrities that appear in the video. Christopher Reeves riding a bike. Really eerie to watch that one. Joey and Marky Ramone are panhandling on a busy sidewalk. So Joey is holding a hat trying to collect donations from people. And Marky Ramone's playing a tuba. It's so weird. Then uh, you see Jane Curtin walk out, Malcolm Forbes, the model Iman, I M A N, Iman, Iman. She was married. Uh, she was a huge supermodel. She was married to David Bowie, Victoria Jackson of Saturday Night Live fame. Sally Kirkland is in one of the scenes. Rick Moranis. I and the only reason I, I didn't say he was the first celebrity is because he's in the movies, so I didn't think it really qualified as being a celebrity appearance. If the song's about the movie and he's in the movie, so yeah, he wasn't first. It was Donald Trump. Lori Singer, Dougie Fresh, if you remember that old school rapper, I saw him in one of the spots in the video, so that was kind of cool to see. Uh, anything else movie wise that I was trying to remember? No, I think that was it. Uh, streaming stuff? No. We covered everything there. TV stuff. The only thing I really saw that was somewhat of an interest, and it's just more of a headline read rather than a, a whole story or needs an explanation. So if you weren't aware, they're remaking Stephen King's The Stand. Now, obviously, the very famous story was made into a miniseries back in, I want to see, was it the late 90s? Somewhere in the late 90s? Very One of his more popular stories, popular translations to television. But they're going to reboot it, and it's going to be on that CBS All Access thing, I believe. But they just announced that they're now casting or, or pulling the cast together for The Stand. So if you're into Stephen King stuff like that, that's good news for you. So hopefully very soon we're going to hear who's actually going to be in this thing. I think it'll be with the way the, uh, the special effects are now, how advanced they are and how cheap they cost to make these special effects. I think it's going to look much better than that glowing hand coming out of the sky into the cornfield to get, you know, the guy who looked like Raven from the WCW ECW era. And that's, uh, that's it. Uh, gaming stuff next week on the show. Our pal, Brian Shea from game informer will be here to talk about everything that he went through at E3 convention last week. We were going to do it this week, but Giddles had to go and do something. So Brian's going to come on next week and we're going to do our big gaming issue, uh, ga issue, uh, gaming episode for all the new video game stuff. But one thing I will mention is Nintendo normally is their own console game. They don't usually share their library with anything else. Well, a few years ago, they experimented and put Super Mario Run, I think it was called, out for cell phones. It was a cell phone game. You could play it. I, I don't know if the Android had it, but I know you could play it on the Apple iOS. So they're doing it again now, they've announced. Their next mobile title to go out is Dr. Mario World. If you're not familiar with Dr. Mario, 
uh, you probably didn't grow up with it. If you are, of course you remember it because it was Nintendo's version of Tetris, which Nintendo had Tetris, but they also made a Mario version of their Tetris where pills and, and viruses would drop down in, in that form and you'd have to match them up and destroy things. So Dr. Mario World is coming to this. Oh, this one's good. Now it's coming to iOS and Android and it's fairly soon, July 10th. So if you were a big Dr. Mario fan or a Mario fan in general, July 10th, you want to download this game for your cellular device and you can have fun with that. I think, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, there's the music. It's going. Okay, we got to get out of here. So let me do the plugs for everything. For me, it's uh, E-Rock Radio across the board, social media. But for the show, it's Eric Nagel across the board. Like us on Facebook and uh, subscribe to us on the YouTube channel. If you could do that, we would appreciate that. If you want to leave a voicemail to be used on future shows, 651 Smithers. That's 651 764 8437. 651 764 8437. Got it? Good. If not, rewind it, write it down. I'm not repeating it a third time. Uh, for Giddles, he's Giddle Base across the board on social media, on Xbox, and uh, I think he's. I don't know what he's doing on the, as far as the PC game streaming. We'll have to ask him next week when he is here. I also want to remind you of my other show called Would You Kindly that I do with AMC's comic book men and Tell em Steve Dave star, Brian Johnson. Him and I do this show every week on Compound Media. Go to compoundmedia.com if you want to subscribe and watch that. It's a TV show. It's not just a, a radio show. It's a TV show. You can get the audio version if you want. We provide you with both. But it's a TV show that you can watch. Visual aids aplenty. Compoundmedia.com. Use the code COMPOUND20 if you want to save 20% on a subscription over there. If you want to support and help us out, we would appreciate that. I think that's about it for this week. So until the next time... Oh, I got to do everybody's parts now. All right. Until the next time, everybody, be excellent to each other and have a wonderful time. And we'll be seeing you. It's Eric Nagel. Did you abscond with the church funds? Did you run off with the senator's wife? I like to think that you killed a man. It's the romantic in me. It's a combination of all three. Alas, we're out of time. Follow It's Eric Nagel on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. For ways to listen to the show, go to itseriknagel.com. And remember to tell two friends so they can tell two friends. And they can tell two friends. And they can tell two friends. And those two friends can tell two friends. Well, you get the idea. <laughs>